Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, today is Thursday, February 29th of 2024. My name is Hector Acuna. Thanks so much for watching this uh, video, either live or the recorded version. Um, I'm going to be discussing part of my online portfolio on my website. So right now we're looking at the homepage of my website. Um, and uh, yeah, just really quickly before I get into talking about the work, I just wanted to share a couple of announcements with you. Um, depending on when you're watching this video, uh, you may be interested in applying to a, uh, a juried show that I will be uh, judging and jurying uh, coming up here soon in the next month or so. Uh, I think the deadline is in March and it's at the Plymouth Art Center. The show is called Alive in the Arts 29th Annual Juried Exhibition. So um, if you live in Wisconsin, especially near Plymouth, Wisconsin, make sure that this is on your radar. Um, check their website for all of the details regarding you know who can apply and uh, you know how to submit your materials and the application. So anyway, check that out if you're in the area. Um, and then something else I'm going to mention, uh, you know, later today, this afternoon, I'm planning to send out a pretty hefty newsletter that I've been working on all week. It's been over a month since I've reached out to my email uh, list subscribers. So if you are subscribed to my email list, definitely check your inbox for this new uh, letter that I'll be sending. There's a lot of videos in it, so it, it should be pretty easy to to read and, and watch and digest. Um, if you're not subscribed to my email list, make sure that you head over to my website up here, um, up here in the contact page. You can just plug in your name and your email and that's as easy as it gets. Then you're on my list and you'll receive all future emails. Um, you might be wondering, well, what's the perk of being on the email list as opposed to subscribing to the YouTube channel or following me on Instagram? Um, the biggest thing is that it's sort of treated like a journal, excuse me, kind of like a journal entry for me. I like to uh, recap things that I've been working on <clears throat> over the last month or two. And then I also treat it kind of like uh, as a way to share updates and future opportunities that I'll be uh, participating in, future shows, maybe there's some process material that I'm talking about. Um, I really try not to just repeat information that's already being shared on other platforms, whether that's Instagram or Facebook or YouTube. Um, and then the other thing is that I also list available paintings or updates to my online shop. So I've sold some paintings through the email list uh, newsletters before and it's a fun way to kind of curate some of those shop updates that I'm doing throughout the year. Uh, I used to do giveaways on my email newsletter so I might be bringing that back this year. We'll see how things go. Uh, I don't typically give away original artwork but um, most of the time it's like free stickers or maybe a small print. Um, something that isn't really too uh, time intensive or uh, too valuable, you know. As an artist, we really should be careful about giving away our work or um, lowering the price of what we make um, as a way to upkeep the integrity of the value of our paintings and our original work. So that's not something that I do with the giveaways, um, but that might be another reason that you might consider joining the email list. And then the last reason is that I also will plug in some exclusive coupons for my online shop. So if you're interested in purchasing something from my shop, um, being on my email list is a good way to, you know, receive some time, like limited edition, I guess, or, or uh, limited time coupons that you can use when you're checking out in my online shop. So I'll have a coupon coming up. I think it's a 10% off coupon, which you know, depending on what you might be interested in purchasing, that could be a, a pretty good amount of money that you're gonna save. So anyway, a little plug for my newsletter. All right, I think that's it. I think I'm ready to go into the portfolio. So this is the fourth live stream, and today I'm going to be finishing up uh, half of the portfolio that I started 
last stream on Tuesday and uh, we were talking about my thesis MFA uh, project, my final year. It was a mixed media installation. Um, so if you didn't watch the third live stream, make sure you go back and check that out. If you're if you're somebody who's really um, you know particular about the order of things, so what's nice about these live streams is that I'm really trying my best to go in kind of a chronological order. Uh, of when these pieces were made. Um, so far it's all been studio-based work and once I'm through my studio portfolio then I'll hop over to the plein air work and talk about those paintings and then move through uh, murals and um, commissions and other aspects of my larger portfolio on my website. Um, so anyway, this is number four. Let's go ahead and see what we have. So. Um, the rest of the portfolio on this page is going to be looking at work that I made right after I graduated with my master's degree. So in the last stream, I talked quite a bit about what it felt like to graduate with my thesis show, uh, going up into the museum on Michigan State's campus at the MSU Broad Art Museum. I was sort of sharing that process of going through COVID right as the work was finished, right as we dropped it off, how that shaped the reception for the show, how it shaped my experience in receiving feedback or just seeing the impact of that very large mixed media installation that I put together. You know, the worst part about that experience was that so many people experienced the show online through some sort of documentation or reproduction and when I was creating the show, I really was trying to think about the physical relationship and interaction of scale um, and that sense of of um, the journey through the work, right? And the whole time I was making and designing the project, that's that's the perspective I had in mind. It wasn't really about, you know, documentation or video or, um, you know, reproductions of the show. I wanted the focus and the impact really to be available when you saw the work in person. And that was something that I think made it such a struggle for me to um, wrap my head around at that time. So coming out of that experience and finishing up my MFA for a few more months, because that happened in March and I didn't graduate until May, like mid-May. So there were still like two months left of the semester at that point. I remember we had to, you know, everybody was on lockdown for the first couple of weeks. Um, and on the, one, on the one hand, it was kind of nice because Megan worked from home for a little while. And, you know, we got to spend a lot of time together. That was probably the best thing about the, the lockdown and the pandemic uh, for me. Um, but one of the challenges that I found was trying to teach a 3D sculpture class online, you know, and, and dealing with students who also felt the pressures of the pandemic and just the social anxieties of, you know, what was happening at that time. It just kind of felt like art making and teaching art really wasn't that important at the time, um, you know, based on conversations I was having, based on what I was seeing in the media and you know, it made it difficult to really end my MFA on a, a positive note. Um, and it was memorable, you know, but for reasons that I would have not preferred. Um, so anyway, I was I was teaching that online 3D class, um, mostly through Zoom. And a lot of the projects had to be documented documented through small cell phone videos that, that students were able to take. And it just was really difficult to figure out how to mimic the classroom environment and atmosphere and collaboration that I had helped sort of cultivate and foster in person prior to the lockdown, right? So it just was a weird, weird transition period. And I stopped painting, I stopped making for like a month and a half, which for me is a really long time. I, I, I have a really hard time going more than two or three days without painting or making something. And uh, just this, the experience and the feeling that everything was flipped upside down or that the rug was pulled out from under me just left me feeling uninspired and, um, you know, in, in this place that was really, I don't know, it, it made it hard to figure out what to make at that time, even though there was a lot of stuff happening and there were a lot of people that had, a, had this new opportunity to 
maybe revisit their creative um, interests that prior to the lockdown were hard to manage um, with their schedule. So, you know, it was it was very opposite to a lot of people that I think were interested in painting and drawing and that kind of stuff uh, during that time. Um, you know, so I, I, all of those feelings of just being confused and feeling a little bit frustrated or even feeling, uh, I don't know, like life was just very kind of absurd and unpredictable and unstable. Uh, I spent like a month and a half just sort of sitting in that mental, emotional state, which was a very big low point for me, you know, um, for those of you who don't know that. And yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I felt like, w why make anything? You know, I just finished making this humongous project. I had just finished this teaching residency that took a lot of time and effort. And, um, you know, I was trying to teach this sculpture class online, but I was also still dealing with finishing the writing of my thesis, the actual written essay that accompanies the project. And that was difficult to also focus on and um, close out with all of this distraction happening with the, the lockdown and the pandemic. And um, yeah, so I, I really wasn't make any, making anything for about a month and a half. But the first thing that I did start to work on was this painting, this sort of hybrid sculpture painting here, uh, which is why I'm starting with this today. Um, and I... At some point, I need to go back and add like dimensions and years and materials into these listings because uh, if I close out here, I don't think, yeah, this doesn't have any of that information right now. So you're, you're sort of left wondering what size this piece is, what the materials are, um, all of those details. So this was produced, produced is a weird word, this was created in the spring, well, late spring, early summer of 2020. So this is sort of this is what I look at as my pandemic painting or my pandemic artwork. And um, so it's primarily an oil painting on panel. And this was a like masonite uh, cradled panel that I had built. Um, I want to say that this is about 13 inches tall, maybe 14 inches tall by probably close to, to 20 or... Maybe it's like a, a 12 by 20 size panel, somewhere in that range, um, if I had to guess. And uh, the painting was created without any kind of drawing or roadmap. Um, if you watched the last live stream, then you, you know it has some similarities in the format of kind of like this collaged space where there's a lot of shifting uh, scales of forms and objects and subjects um, and it's painted in this very uh, somewhat smooth glazy kind of approach or method um, and everything accumulated over time in this painting it wasn't like I started in one corner and then made everything to the opposite corner. It sort of was like, I, I painted something here, I, I jumped over here and painted something, and then I moved back over here. And every time I would add something to the painting, excuse me, it would kind of give me an idea of what else I wanted to put into it, or it would sort of raise a new question, or it would remind me of something else that would be kind of um, important to also bring into the painting or maybe I would go back and I would shift the way that something else that I thought was finished should be finished or should be painted um, you know so there are a lot of these moments where I was glazing these very soft smooth layers of transparent uh, paint or translucent paint um, over some of the forms and subjects but obviously it's a self-portrait it's partially a self-portrait and um, you know I call it my pandemic painting because it's supposed to feel very absurd and irrational and um, surprising, which those are the feelings I felt at this time with the timing of the lockdown and when our thesis show went up, um, you know, that the like chances of things lining up that way just felt so rare at that time and in that moment. And I was just kind of like, why did this have to happen right now? Like, why couldn't this have happened in a month or in two months or, 
you know, never. Why, why did this happen at all? You know, and what was crazy is that I'm sure most of you can remember, like, when you first heard about COVID, it was, it felt far away, right? It started in China. And then after a few months, it was like, okay, you're, you're starting to see this word reappear over and over and over in the news. And again, it still felt kind of far away. You know, all of the fall and winter months of 2019 into 2020, to me, it was like, that's never going to affect my life. You know, even though I knew it was this thing that was out there, it, it, it seemed somewhat serious, but everybody that would talk about it locally or even in the U.S. didn't seem that concerned. Like they didn't seem like it was something that we were going to have to experience or that was going to affect us. And, you know, later I realized that that was all just sort of wishful thinking and just ignorance of, you know, how connected our world actually is and how quickly things like um, viruses can spread from person to person nowadays with how often people travel. Anyway, I don't want to get political, um, but that moment in time, for me, it held all of these strange feelings, which I'm sure most of you probably relate to, just like feeling like, what the heck is happening right now? And uh, how do I make sense of this this moment in history? Um, you know, and I remember there were some friends, I say friends, the people I've ne maybe never met online who were also final grad students in their final year at other universities across the country. And some of them had their shows scheduled for right around the same time that we did, which was like middle of March, 2020. But a couple of people I know had their shows in February, like early or mid February. And, you know, I remember all through February, like starting to see some of these images and posts from other grad students across the country who were having their shows and like just seeing their moment of, 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 you know, celebration and success and seeing their moment of connect connection with their, you know, community of people, whether that was the academic community, whether it was their friends or their families or artists that they admired, like just seeing these little posts starting to happen was like getting me really, really excited for, for the show, you know, and I was like, all right, we're up next, like it's coming up. And then that's when everything kind of halted with the pandemic. So, you know, fast forward to like April, end of April, middle of April. By that point, I was like, okay, you know what? This is out of my control. This is just something that is a wild story and it's a wild um, timeline of events. And it's just, this is how it happened. This is how it's going to be. And I was starting to slowly piece together how I was going to deal with this this experience that was totally out of my control you know and that for me that's really the lesson of of my experience with covid was being reminded that so much of our lives are are out of our control and there's there's this very small thing that we do have any kind of autonomy and control over and that's how we feel and how we make sense of what it is that happens to us and honestly that little lesson is a universal thing that I needed to experience, I think, at that time. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of the experience of being an artist, right? It's like making our work is this process of making sense of things that happen, right? And sense of, of ideas that we have, of theories that we have, of questions that we have, um, and putting it out into this other format for other people to then also experience and then make sense of and question and learn from. So. To me, this painting became all about throwing everything onto the panel that related to that moment in time for me. So obviously there's this self-portrait and I'm, I'm laying down. It's a very large portrait in, in comparison to everything else in the painting. It's kind of the, the largest thing in the painting. So I don't know what that tells us, if it's just like, this is just all about how I felt in the moment, which is probably how I would describe this painting anyway. So um, I think maybe this is what I had started with to be honest. I think I, if I remember correctly, I started with this self-portrait and I placed it not knowing that this painting was going to go in this kind of unique frame object that I constructed when I thought it was just going to be the panel. I put it off to the right side 
in this place that I would consider to be fairly, um, I don't know, not unstable or like, I don't know. To me, it feels very like transient or very liminal, right? It's It almost feels like we're seeing a frame panning from left to right or right to left. And like, we're just freezing that frame before we focus on the person, right? And, or like the larger view. Um, so I liked that it sort of, it feels like I'm passing this portrait by uh, in this kind of sweeping motion. And as we're sweeping, we're seeing all of these other objects and forms and characters in the painting. So the other thing I'll, I'll say next is I knew pretty early on I wanted to paint my wife or my girlfriend at the time. Um, you know, Megan and I met back in 2012 that summer. So by this point, we had known each other for eight years, you know, and we'd been together for a really long time. Um, we were living together for three years at this point, almost three years. And she really was my partner and my my person and still is. And without her, I think that experience would have been much darker and much, um, I don't know, more a lot more confusing and frustrating. And it would have been harder, I think, for me to feel grounded. And I'm lucky and I'm really fortunate that I, I found someone who, you know, is, is that person for me through so much of my... Um, highs and lows in life, you know, and I really am grateful for her partnership and um, everything that she brings to my life creatively and personally, right? So for that moment in time, she was such an important person who was right there going through all the same stuff with me. And she had her version of the experience, but she was there before and after the pandemic, right? So it's like, I'm, I feel, as I say that, I feel so, so fortunate that um, I wasn't, by myself, you know, and I had someone with me that um, I could I could share that weird time with. Um, so she was a big part of this this painting, and you know, we spent a lot of time. I remember um, this is only a couple of years ago, so it's easy to remember this stuff. But we, as they were starting to kind of loosen the lockdown rules, I remember we spent quite a bit of time walking and biking and just sort of sitting out in parks and in nature as like April and May started to roll around and it was getting nicer outside in Michigan. Um, we used to spend a lot of time biking and walking down the river trail in, in Lansing, Michigan, which if you live in that area, you probably have been there. You probably are familiar with the river trail. It's an amazing asset to the city of Lansing. Um, and we spent a lot of time before the pandemic traveling between the little sort of districts and, and parts of the city because um, we lived pretty close to downtown Lansing. And um, yeah, I also appreciate just that aspect of my experience in Michigan. Being centrally located to Lansing was was really cool, you know, and that was something that um, really shaped the experience that Megan and I got to have together. So um, that reclining pose that we both have in this painting that that's sort of how I felt at the time. It was sort of dealing with this experience that was out of my control and just allowing it to happen uh, in a way, you know, and trying not to get too distracted in wasting all of the good stuff that was right in front of me, you know, and shifting my focus on some of the good things. But this painting became very cathartic, as you can probably tell, uh, for dealing with all of those things, right? And dealing with like, you know, pressures and, and anxieties and and just the weirdness of that time, you know, so there's things in here that, like my little thesis painting, this is the 10 by 12 foot painting I made for my thesis show, shrunk down to this little teeny tiny pocket size version. Um, you know, so I was still, I was still dealing with like the show and dealing with like finishing this monumental project that uh, just got like, the pause button played on and you know I was dealing with uh, I don't know just like this feeling of, of like a picnic you know and I think that was that's part of the name of the title of this painting it's like something about I thought we were going to have a picnic or aren't we going to have a picnic or uh, something about wanting to do a picnic but then it got sort of canceled or it got shrunk down or, or flipped upside down something like that um, you know, so there's the grill and there, you know, we were barbecuing a lot at that time and, uh, you know, just like 
some of that, some of those habits were also very central to that section of, uh, of time. And I know I'm spending a lot of time talking about this painting. Um, and, uh, you know, if this is, if you're watching the recorded version, feel free to jump ahead. Um, but it, it was a very important painting for me because it was the first painting I made finishing my, my MFA project. Technically, I was still in school when I started this painting. Um, and I remember once I really got into the imagery and I really started to flow with the ideas, that's when I was like, you know, this is just another part of being a painter. It's another side of living my life as an artist and allowing my work to be that space where I can where I can go when my personal life is like really um, nonsensical, you know, and really strange. And so this painting became a space where I could go in and I could just put in these feelings of like uncertainty and, and weirdness and absurdness, you know, the absurdity was something I was really interested in, I think, at uh, at that time, even before the pandemic. But going through the lockdown, I think, just turned that volume really, really high. And I wanted to see what would happen if I um, channeled some of those feelings into a very, like, distilled, explicit type of language. So one of the things I like about the painting is that it has this crisp clarity of description and there's moments where certain forms that are very ambiguous are painted really clearly, but then other forms that have a, a more uh, readable representation are painted in a looser, more gestural, um, abstract kind of way, which I like that that play on representation in this painting too. Um, you know, and then there's also some references to aspects of my thesis show. So if you watched that live stream, you know, there's bits of the colored paper that I put in here by the ear. Um, obviously, there's a the little painting. Um, trying to think, that might be, it might just be those two references here, actually. Uh, but yeah, and then I have this little robin with a uh, one of those like snow fuzzy hats. Um, and I forget where this came from. I think part of it might have been from my mural that I, I did uh, with the Lansing Art Path. Actually, talking about the River Trail, there's a mural project that I participated in two years uh, while we lived in Michigan. And my first mural that I did, this is kind of a sidetrack, and it's a little preview of my mural portfolio, but I did this mural called Robin, and it was really long. It was fairly graphic and fairly simple with the amount of information but one of the key parts obviously was this bird that was painted about three feet tall I would say by maybe a foot and a half wide um, so it's, it was the largest sort of uh, image in the mural and I was up for about a month before somebody or a group of people came and tagged over the mural and I remember I was the one who discovered that it was tagged on a run during the lockdown, um, or no, it was during the the fall semester, like September area of 2019 of my final year. That's when I discovered that the mural was tagged, which obviously was a big bummer. And uh, one of the things I remember they said was nice bird, you know, so, and they didn't tag over the robin, which I thought was interesting. Or no, maybe they did. I think they put like, like a bra or something over the robin. It was weird, I don't know. Never found out who did that. Anyway, before I close up on this painting, um, I'll talk a little bit about the frame. So once I was pretty much done with the painting, I wanted to, I don't know, I was still in kind of like this like structural construction building mindset from my thesis show, which obviously that big barn uh, structure and the miniature, like there were a lot of these like just building textures to my show. and. I really was interested in pushing that quality, you know, in my own space. And fortunately, I've had a job site, like small um, table saw for like, I don't know, I think since 2015. And I have a miter saw, you know, I had a shop vacuum that was my mom's old shop vacuum. Um, I have a air compressor and a little, uh, you know, uh, nail gun. I think I had to go buy the air compressor around this time. But anyway, I had most of the tools I needed to build stuff. And um, fortunately, even though we lived in the city, 
I got away with, you know, running my table saw, running my miter saw, just like pulling things out of our basement, setting them up for the day, cutting things down, building stuff, gluing things together, taking everything down, cleaning everything up. Like that's how I would have to work because we didn't have like a garage and we didn't have a yard that was fenced in and like private. Um, And even though we were renting out of a duplex house that was like three or four feet away from a apartment complex, you know, most of the time people were pretty okay with me making a ton of noise and building stuff during that summer of the lockdown. So I'm pretty sure I finished the frame in like June of 2020. And I started it probably like end of May. But the beginning of May, middle of May is when I was uh, sketching ideas for the frame. And actually I can show you, I have my sketchbook here that I started uh, in 2020. This is the op- This is the first page. So it's got some stickers and some crazy drawings, but you can see up here, let's see if it'll focus. It says 0520. So this started in May of 2020. And, uh, you know, these are some of the pages. I don't want to show you everything because I have a sketchbook, you know, portfolio that I want to talk about in a different stream. But I did want to jump to a page where I was drawing this frame. I think I, I think I drew it here in the sketchbook first, but um, trying to remember. I knew I know I also worked on it. Oh, yeah, here we go. I worked on it. Um, on my iPad as well, because it was easy to bring a photo of the painting and then, you know, sort of design things digitally. But this was the initial, uh, like, blueprint sketch that I made for the frame. And I don't remember if I designed the frame loosely on paper and then I, like, mapped out the dimensions or if I designed it digitally. I think that's probably what I did. I pulled the photo into a program called Autodesk Sketchbook, and then just digitally came up with this idea. And then I measured the painting and then figured out, you know, what size I wanted to build the frame. And it's definitely one of the most elaborate frames that I've ever made for a painting. And this photo doesn't really do justice to the 360 experience when you see this painting. It's about, the frame is about five or six inches deep. So it's a pretty thick, frame and it feels like a sculpture like it feels like a a real big dimensional object that sits on a wall so the back side is open and you can see like how everything is held together and i made a uh, french cleat hanging system so i took a piece of wood and just ripped it down the middle at a diagonal so you end up with these two pieces that fit together on a diagonal one of those pieces gets installed to the back of the frame the other one is is loose and you can uh, drill holes in it and then install it to a wall and then everything hangs off of that cleat so that's a french cleat system if you if you didn't know anyway um so the uh when you turn the whole painting, this section over here um, has this little rubber stopper, like for a bathtub that I found either like at a Goodwill or I bought it new from like a a hardware store. Um, And then there's a string that runs into a little tiny hole on this little wall. Um, And I wanted that line to connect into the painting. And if, again, if you watched the third live stream for my thesis work, you probably remember the string that I had inside my miniature barn, you know? So I had all this twine and I really wanted to play around with different materials um, in the frame. There's a lot of glue, wood glue uh, marks on the frame. I didn't do a very good job of sanding that off before I stained it. And I knew I wanted to stain the frame because I wanted this to feel like a building. I wanted it to feel like barn wood and, really kind of like beat up and weathered and and have a lot of character so there's a lot of you know haphazard joints and it's not like it doesn't look unstable but it doesn't look super pristine and that was the the sweet spot that i was trying to get to with this painting um and i also wanted to mimic some of this architecture that's in the painting right so if we look at this top portion of the frame, those lines on the sides connect to this part of the painting. So I wanted there to be moments where 
all of a sudden the painting turns into a real object, you know, or the real object turns into this other version of itself in the painting. And it's funny, like when I'm when I'm talking about work that I made over the years, there's moments where I'm like, man, that was really fun. Like I really want to get back to that and try that today. You know, I've every year it's like I feel a little bit more confident with the skills or the materials or um, how I would go about making something. And when you look back at your portfolio, you can look at your work, at least for me, and I can go, man, if I made that today, I would do this, I would do that, I would try this, maybe it would turn out better, um, or maybe I would push it in a more you know, new and exciting way for me uh, that feels different and it feels like, oh, what if I tried this instead? So anyway, as I'm talking about this, my mind is already kind of like, hmm, maybe I need to uh, spend some time this summer like really thinking about frames and really thinking about how my studio work, or you know what, maybe even some of my plein air paintings, how, the, how those frames can be a little bit more thoughtful and uh, dynamic, you know. Okay, I'm almost done. So on the last side here that I wanted to point out, it, you can't see it from this angle, but on this, this wall, Right, so it's like here's the front. I don't want to spill my coffee. Here's the front of the frame. If I turned it, so you saw this piece was this little wall right here. You know, so you're looking at it from the side. There's a little metal drain cup that you would install in like a sink or a bathtub or some sort of a container that you wanted water to be able to flow through. And that little piece is glued into a hole, so it's flush with this this side of the of the box frame. So I wanted it to feel like if you pulled this rubber tab, whatever's inside of that uh, you know, container, somehow something would happen, you know. And when I exhibited this painting the few times that I have, that's it's not an interactive piece. Like you can't you're not allowed to go up and pull the tab or or mess with anything, but I like that there are these little details of objects and found objects that can you know, it can add this extra layer of interpretation or raise new questions about the object itself, but then also about what's happening in the painting, you know? So I kind of liked this flushing bathtub um, tone or theme with the image of this painting. You know, this painting, it feels like this really weird and like, not like I said, nonsensical, absurd space um, and like combination of characters that is just waiting to be flushed out, you know? And I think for me, when I, once I built the frame and I added those little details, it really felt like, okay, this painting is done, you know? And it really felt like I put everything I wanted to put into that painting. It allowed me to, to, to make sense of everything and to move on and to just put it into something else. And that's one of the best things to, um, uh, one of the best aspects about being an artist, you know, and being someone who, uh, can create stuff from your experience, you know, and allowing what you are thinking about uh, to come in and inform the work. So anyway, there are a couple other paintings that I was making right around those same months, April and May and June of 2020. This is another pandemic painting, you know. I the other the first one I really term the pandemic painting, but this is one that also was helping me kind of process all of this stuff that was happening at that time. So, you know, I've got all these like random crazy characters. And um, I think around this time, I was also really falling in love with painting again. You know, I had finished the animation. I had finished the sculptures. I had finished teaching. I had finished, you know, all of these different mixed media, multimedia methods of working. And I just wanted to get back to painting, you know, and I wanted to fall in love with painting again. And these these pieces really helped me with that. So um, when I look at them now, they really feel like paintings that have helped me explore the diversity in visual language, you know, and painting languages. And, you know, this painting I think is called Congratulations, if I remember correctly, but I wanted to misspell congratulations so instead of a t after the a r or after the r a i put a d you know because i was like this is this is also about my time of being a grad student at michigan state you know so what i don't want to do today and in these streams is sit here and be like this is what this means this is what that means this is what this means because that's really what that does is it 
it kind of kills the interpretation that other people can have. However, I know that there are pieces I've made, especially when you look at them as a group where it's like, okay, what's happening? How does this make sense? And some people like to have some context, right? So that's really part of the part of the point of doing these live streams is to give people a little bit of information, you know, that maybe can help shape how they access the paintings and the work. So, um, you know, a few other things I'll add in, like a couple of little Easter eggs that I liked in this painting. So one of the things, again, self-portrait, as you saw, and then there's these other weird kind of characters that I just kind of made up. This painting was made on paper. So it's an oil painting on primed paper that was mounted to a wood panel. And honestly, one of my favorite surfaces to work on because you can draw like a drawing on the paper. This is on Bristol heavyweight, like Bristol board paper. Um, and it's really easy to erase. It's really easy to rework things. And then once you like the drawing, you just have to spray fix the drawing with fixative spray, let that dry and then coat the drawing with like two or three layers of matte medium. And the matte medium is translucent, almost transparent. It's got a little bit of a waxy like fuzziness, which I like, honestly, because it, it kind of like softens the drawing. Um, and I think if it was really like super clear, I wouldn't like painting over it because then the lines and the edges are a little too sharp and too crisp. But with the matte medium, it's really easy to just start painting and almost like scumbling and glazing into that waxy surface. Um, so what I like about it is that it's easy to get very smooth, glazy surfaces um, or surface areas, but then also to just build up the opacity and like the thickness of the paint in other areas. So it's a really versatile way to work. Um, a lot of illustrators work this way. James Gurney works this way. I think that's he's one of the first people that I saw doing that and really talking about it. And, um, you know, sometimes you see a, a material or a process and you kind of go, Oh, I don't know if that's archival or I don't know if that's really the best way to make a painting, but there are people that I definitely trust like James Gurney. There's another guy uh, out of Columbia, an artist, also a big YouTube artist, Nicholas Uribe. Um, both of them worked over matte medium before, and I've had professors that have done it too. So there were enough people that kind of like, primed my um, process using this material and kind of gave me the confidence like, hey, this is a, another great way to work if you like to draw and paint. Because some people just like to paint, you know, they don't want to worry about a drawing, they don't want to work or think in terms of line as much as other people do. Um, and I really like that sweet spot between painting and drawing. And uh, that's how, this is one of the ways that, um, one of the reasons why I like this painting now so much. But anyway, real quick, um, talking about you know the pandemic and talking about, um, I'm reading Jane's comment real quick. So Jane says, I like the explanation on this one. I thought it was bizarre, but now it has a more profound meaning. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'm glad that some of the context I'm sharing can help with people's interpretations and making sense of you know, some of the like, randomness that the paintings have at first glance, you know, and honestly, that was something that took me a long time to be comfortable with, with painting in my studio work is making a painting, knowing that if someone just comes up to it with a cold read, it might look a little weird, or it might seem a little confusing or, you know, challenging in um, navigating their own interpretation. And like I said, it took me a while to become okay with that. But once I did, it sort of was like, hey, anything goes now, you know, like it's not really, it's not really my job to make paintings that are supposed to mean the same thing to everyone who interacts with the work, right? So um, it made it easier for me to kind of tap into the kind of weird and, and surreal and uncanny and, and, and bizarre um, types of images that I wanted to make at these different times um, in my career. So so anyway, this was a painting that really helped helped me fall back in love with painting again and the process of, of, of inventing images. And, you know, for the most part, the what we see structurally to this painting was in the drawing. And when I share the sketchbook portfolio at some point in the future, um, 
if people are watching this recording, hopefully there'll be a moment where they go, oh, that that's the drawing for the congratulations painting because it's pretty straightforward. It looks almost identical. Um, obviously there's no color, but everything else is pretty much there in the in the structure of the painting. But anyway, now that people have a little bit more context for this one and the time period at which I made the painting, you know, it might be a little bit more enjoyable to 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 read into and to go see. Um, but there were some things I was doing that were really fun, like this weird, wacky animal, almost like dinosaur character um, object, you know, that is, again, it's pulling some of the the feeling and the qualities that I had in my in my thesis show with like the pockets on the body holding objects um, you know combining that with more familiar forms like a human arm you know and there's people pulling out flowers and there's just a lot of these little Easter egg kind of moments that I wanted the painting to have to give viewers like this journey that they could experience and explore all right, what's next? Here's another kind of wacky little painting. Um, this is one that did not start from a drawing, so it's a it's a little bit closer to like the first hybrid frame painting I showed today, where I just started with one thing and then that led into something else. Um, when I look at this little painting, this is about I forgot to tell you the dimensions of the last one. The last one is I think 11 by 14 inches. This one is I think maybe like five by seven or four by, no, I think it's five by seven. Uh, really small little kind of intimate painting. And this little boat form here, that was painted from observation. That's an actual like little toy that I have that I saved from like my childhood home. And you know, some of the stuff that we grew up with, I've decided to hang on to, not a lot, um, but I remember I don't know why, maybe when my mom was selling our house, uh, I went through some of the stuff and just was like, I'm gonna keep some of these things. And some of the stuff I have, I, I, I hung on to and I took prior to you know, her going through that process of selling the house. But um, I don't remember when I snagged this little toy plastic boat. And this is a, obviously a thumbtack here. Um, and the rest of this is all invented stuff. And, you know, I was looking at a lot of surrealist paintings by people like Frida Kahlo. I was looking at uh, Max Ernst. Um, I was looking at some Dali paintings at that time. Um, you know, and as I said, I was falling back in love with painting. And whenever you graduate, if you go to art school, as soon as you graduate and you've had some time, like maybe you move or a few months have gone by, like there's a moment where you kind of start to feel like, wow, I can paint whatever I want to paint. I can take as long as I want. I can choose to share this with the world. I can choose to hide it. I can choose to destroy it. I can choose to paint over it. Everything kind of becomes up to you as the artist. And I've been really fortunate to have that experience twice after my undergrad degree and then after my MFA experience. And um, this was one of those paintings where it kind of felt like, you know, I'm just going to play and I'm going to start somewhere and just see what can happen, see what can come of this image. And it was a painting that is a great example of letting the process take over and allowing the um, intuitive side of painting to steer the process and to really steer the direction of the work. Um, just checking to see where our dog is. He's in a different room. But anyway, uh, as I was saying, um, so it's hard to really kind of like define this painting for me. You know, it's I can look at it and I, and I can say, well, it's kind of like this and it's kind of like that. And, you know, the clarity and the sharpness of the the way this little boat that, that's hovering in space is painted, like that's pretty easy for me to go in and define or like categorize or associate to a feeling or an experience or an idea. Um, and then there's other things where like, I'm like, I don't really know what this is. I don't know if this is supposed to be a character. I don't know if this is supposed to be a, a stand-in for a figure, excuse me, or how this form then relates to some of these other forms. Cause like on this little furry blob figure character, there's like this, to me, this is like a little band-aid with blood, you know, that's it's like this wounded 
little character and figure that's got a very fuzzy little head or a fuzzy spot of hair. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let people decide what this painting means and represents, and that's honestly the best part about making a painting sometimes is making something that doesn't have an answer. It doesn't have one specific idea or meaning, and it's meant to just generate conversation, right, and discussion, maybe even debate. And um, it's, it's great to sit here today and go through my portfolio and and, and find all these reminders, you know, and that's something I, I don't I don't appreciate enough is the fact that our own work can be like reminders of trains of thought or philosophies or, you know, good practices to keep as a person, let alone as an artist. So anyway, moving right along, this is all like summer of 2020, everything we're looking at now. Um, and this painting was part of a project that was very like online based, like everything at this time uh, for most of us, especially artists. And uh, there was a community of painters, um, all ages, all demographics, all nationalities, as far as I could tell, it was not exclusive to any one group of people. Um, that was called Kane Yo, C A N E dash Yo, Y O. And it was a group that was started and cultivated by a couple of figurative painters that were definitely in my generation uh, in the US. I think a couple of them live in London, maybe a few other European countries. And um, there were a few people that I had been following in that kind of core group of artists. There's a guy. Milo, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, um, him, and then there's another artist who's American, uh, crap, forgetting his name, it might come to me at some point during the stream, but that, those two artists and maybe like four or five other, uh, Alexander Wilby is another guy, um, Mauro Martinez is another artist that I've been following for a really long time who was kind of in the Kanyo group. Ray Klein, she was a, she's a Michigan-based artist, really successful, really, really amazing painter um, uh, who's also kind of like in that Kanyo group, or at least for a little while it seemed like. Oh, Dennis was another artist in that group. But anyway, I've been following these guys and, and women and artists um, for a while leading up to the pandemic and partway through the summer of COVID, uh, after some of those stimulus checks were coming in, I think a lot of people were getting into painting and, and like they found this community called Kanyo and it was really very, probably still is, I haven't looked into it recently, but um, it was a really kind of budding online group of people that were all interested in figurative representational kind of surrealist um, painting for the most part at least that's my that was my interpretation so when I found that group and I was looking at things that they were sharing and like ideas they were coming up with to um, collaborate across platforms whether that was Instagram or YouTube or Twitch or uh, I think there was another app that they used called uh, Telegram I think is what it's called and the cool thing about that app on Telegram was that they would share like daily paintings, you know, and it was just this like stream of of like a chat. So people could, they could respond to images, they could respond to what other people are saying. Um, it was a really great way to just like learn from other people, share ideas, get to know people. I didn't really post a ton. Um, I wasn't that active on the app. However, they would also post a lot of reference photos. So it was a really great way to go and find reference material just for practicing painting, you know, stuff that, you know, images people were taking at their houses during the lockdown and of their friends or of their cats, of their room. So it was this really kind of like, like beautiful renaissance period online for representational figurative painter for like half a year, it seemed like, at least to me keep waiting to drink my coffee now it's getting cold um, but anyway this was a particular image that kind of became like a challenge set up by the Kanyo group where they uh, 
they all found this um, cursed image. I'm not the most uh, versed person in in like online kind of lingo, but there is this subcategory of images. I think probably it started on Reddit or something, and they're called cursed images, and they're kind of like memes. Um, and some of them are really bizarre. Some of them are really funny. A lot of them are kind of in between that realm, those two realms. Um, but this was a, a, a photo that was found and shared in that Telegram app. And everybody was encouraged to paint this image and paint it in your way that you want. So this was my interpretation. This is on an 8 inch by 10 inch uh, plywood panel that I primed with oil paint. Um, so what I liked about this painting is that I incorporated a lot of uh, glazing techniques. So when we look closely, there's all of this like really subtle um, lo like luminosity in the transparency of the paint in this cadmium red, super, super chromatic saturated paint. Um, even in the portrait, like I, I think I had painted this in two or three different layers. And initially I had painted the painting almost like full color spectrum and or like full color palette and then I wanted to almost simplify the palette with two main uh, hues so I decided to go with this complementary kind of color scheme with green and red and then I even kind of pushed it towards more of a turquoisey uh, seafoam green color in some areas but when I glazed over the like wider range in chroma, there ended up being all of these really interesting interactions of color happening through this atmospheric veil of cadmium red. So we end up with these like interesting reddish orange moments, these more muted reds because it's over a green color or these like violet reds, um, bluish reds and gray kind of reds. So what I really like about this painting is that it reminds me of like the, I don't know, maybe the power or the interest when, it's hard to put this into words at times, but the excitement and interest that you can find in your paintings when you make something and then you go over it with a like unifying layer of, of a glaze. And um, this is a painting that has that, that high contrast between um, like opaque clarity and range and color to that like atmospheric almost ghostly surface quality in some areas so anyway I made this painting um, I made this little maple frame I think I made this maybe I didn't it's hard to tell sometimes if I made the frame that they're in I might I might have bought this frame it's hard to hard to remember because I made a few maple frames at this time but I know I didn't make this one because the like lower level of the float that like channel in between the painting and the frame is also maple and I didn't make mine that way so this was one that I bought um, this was another Kanyo photo reference uh, I think this panel is probably like an 8 by 12 size panel um, this is on I think a piece of of masonite or MDF. Um, actually, somebody purchased this painting uh, during the lockdown period, and you know, I think I sold it for like 150 bucks or something like that. And you know, that was <clears throat> very helpful at the time. And you know, this was this was kind of a study. It was a little color study, and um, really trying to play with color contrasts and color theory relationships, and um, approaching the the portrait of this person that I've never met before um, in a way where I could be a little bit more playful of the representation and the, de the depiction of the person. Sometimes when I'm painting people that I know personally or that I've met, it can be, it can be a little challenging to allow the work to go where maybe I want it to go um, in ways that are more experimental and um, maybe not as, uh, what's the word, maybe not as flattering to the person. So when you're painting a person or a place that you're like, I don't really have a big connection to it. To me anyway, it's like permission to like do whatever I want, you know, and not really worry or consider how that person might feel 
in the ways that I'm depicting them. And even though I've painted my family members and Megan, I've painted myself, I've painted friends, there are times where I'll treat it like this. Like I'm like, you know, this person, they're not gonna care. And you know, it's, it doesn't matter if they care or if they didn't like it. Like what matters is how I wanna make the work. And most of the time, I think I've, I've gotten to a point now where I'm pretty good at trusting myself and trusting the process and trusting the work as like, this isn't a photo. It's not meant to be a literal depiction of the person. It's not supposed to be this, you know, portrait in a way that like, that um, kind of uh, creates this lasting permanent impression of who this person is. It's not meant to sum up them as, a, as, an, as an entire experience or person. So anyway, I'm getting kind of deep with that. But anyway, this painting was a lot of fun because I could just really push the color. And obviously when we look at the face, what I like about this painting is when I pull back and we see the full painting, some of those color relationships that are very high contrast, they 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 don't sit super forward in the painting. Like there's moments like in the eyes where like even from a distance, those eyes are pretty piercing. And I think part of that is because the eyes have this yellowish green hue to them that that green, that little bit of green is popping against the red that surrounds the eye on both sides, right? And obviously the shadow on the face is very cool but to me, this blue, I mean, the value of this blue on the cheek is very bright in comparison to the shadow of the hair, but its relationship to the purple, I feel like isn't that, it's not as high of a contrast, right? Because they're analogous colors, they're side, they're, they're next to each other on the color wheel, unlike green and red, which are opposite the color wheel, right? So we can think of the color wheel as this space to play with contrast, right? And we can play with, with, inching our way between moments or like bringing together the highest powerful form of contrast um, in terms of, of hue and complementary colors. Um, sorry, I keep turning around. My dog is, my, our dog Lenny keeps coming in and out of this room and kind of whining a little bit to go outside. So I just want to make sure I let him out if he has to go to the bathroom. But um, yes, yeah, so this was a, a fun painting to make. Learned a lot about working very chromatically with a lot of, of super saturated colors. All right, and this is another one of those Kenyo portrait paintings. Um, you know, I think for me, part of the reason why I enjoyed making these paintings at this time was because I had just finished my thesis show that was like the most thoughtful project and body of work I'd ever produced. You know, I, I had thought about every layer in that show and I thought about how each part and each piece and each decision contributed to this, this larger narrative and this larger context. And honestly, I was just fried and burnt out. And then when you combine that with the the feeling of the pandemic and the lockdown and just things not making sense. It's like, I just wanted to paint something that was simple. You know, I wanted to paint something that was straightforward. It didn't need to be super conceptual. It didn't need to have a lot of, you know, critical context and it didn't have to be put under a microscope. It could just be about the love of painting, the joy of painting, painting as, as its own thing. You know, the, the contrast and the meaning and the interpretations can come out of these more non-objective moments in color theory or in paint texture and the language of painting or the composition or the tonal range in the values, right? And it's like, again, as I said earlier, I wanted to fall back in love with painting, the process of painting. I didn't want to have to be bogged down by what I was painting and how I was painting. I just wanted to paint. And approaching this Kanyo figure, you know, painting community was perfect at that time because I was flooded every day. There was like, you'd click into the telegram and I'm, I apologize if the app is not called telegram. I don't, I don't think I have it installed on my phone, so I can't even check, but, um, it's a free, like, it's almost like a free version of Facebook. Not that Facebook isn't free, but it's more simple. It's just posts. You can't people people don't have profiles or if they do, they're really simple. It's just like their name, their like username, a profile picture, that's pretty much it. You know, and maybe you can go in and find things that they've posted in the stream. 
of like information. Um, but otherwise it was very open and straightforward. And every day you'd click on the app and there would just be this like flood of images and like, like, you know, statements or like short little uh, sentences that people could, could comment. And uh, it was fun just to like wake up every day and go and be like, well, I wonder what people are posting. I wonder what I could maybe paint from. And it was nice because the guidelines set forth by the, administ the administrator group on Kano's, you know, Telegram, they said if you post an image, you're essentially you're giving people the right to use it as reference for art making and for their work. And people are not allowed to sell your photo, you know, but they can use your photo as uh, source material for painting, which they could then sell, you know, and it's like, it was very clearly like laid out, you know, this isn't a way to make money. It's not a way to advance your career. You know, if you, it's just a way to share and give permission to photographs that like you, you kind of wanted people to take and interpret and, and uh, create with. So this painting was made over a panel. It's, I think this is eight by 10 inches. I think I still have this painting, which if I do, I hope I do, because I really like this painting. You know, it turned out just super buttery. There's all of these like interesting textures on the face and in the forehead. And I love these little bits of color these like warm and cool notes uh, that I was putting in the painting. Obviously it was painted fairly loosely. It was painted fairly quickly. There's a roughness to it, a very organic um, uh, quality and visceral quality about the way it was painted. Um, you know, because I was looking at so many images of people's like selfies and like portraits of other people that were being shared on the app, I kind of got interested in portrait painting again. And it reminded me of like people like Rembrandt, who is like, you know, the epitome of portrait painter. And like, he is someone who made paintings, especially self portraits, but his portrait paintings in general, they're not only accurate in depicting like the, the, the natural depiction of the figure that was being painted, they also have this presence of an emotive quality, right? When you look at one of his paintings in person, I'm not saying the reproductions do this, but the physical paintings of Rembrandt's works in person, when you stand up close to them, my little forehead of this, this gentleman here is nothing compared to a Rembrandt painting. I mean, there are these interesting little combinations of kind of, you know, chunky, gooey paint and uh, temperature contrasts, value contrasts, you know, there's different, movement in the way that the marks are being applied, but this is nothing compared to a Rembrandt painting. So when I was looking at portrait painters like Rembrandt at this time, I was super inspired by the the visceral nature of paint and the ability for paint as a medium to contain energy, right? And to contain a feeling that moves you visually. Um, and that's partially what inspired this portrait. Uh, and I believe this this gentleman's name is like Giuseppe, or I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled like T-S-J-E-B-B-E. -B -B -E. And the only reason I remember his name is because I painted his photos that he shared like two or three different times. Um, that was one of my favorites. Here's another one. And, uh, you know, this is one where, you know, he was playing with taking a time-lapse photo where... It, it can like pause and snap moments of movement, right? So you end up with these very fragmented, almost abstract, uh, very expressive references, which are really fun to paint if you're going to try to like match them um, because they're already so abstract, right? And it allows you to not, not think of painting the portrait. It helps you see like when you paint anything representationally, you kind of have to think abstractly, if that makes sense. You, the, the better you are at seeing like an object as shapes of color and lines of color and shapes and lines of different brightness and darkness or what we call values, you know, it just makes the process of painting representationally so much easier to navigate. Not easier to be successful at, but easier to know where something needs to be pushed and where something needs to be adjusted or tweaked. So this was a painting that was really fun to um, incorporate some of those strategies. And actually, I think I think I either sold this one or I 
or I have it. That's like every painting. But the reason I think this one may have sold is because I remember shipping a little, five, I think this is five by seven inches, maybe four by six. Uh, but I shipped one of two paintings that looked just like this one uh, to a collector during the pandemic lockdown. I don't think I have the other one in the portfolio, but we'll see. Uh, this was a self-portrait painting that I made based off of a photograph I took um, when I was in the process of shaving my pandemic beard, as I would you know, call it now. But when I installed my thesis show, I was fairly well-kept. I mean, I look more well-kept today because I just got my hair cut last night uh, from Megan. But... You know, going into the exhibition for the thesis show in March, I was planning to like, you know, probably get a haircut, clean things up a little bit. And then with everything that happened with the pandemic and COVID through the spring and the early summer of 2020, I kind of just was like, I'm going to just not care about how I look and I'm not going to care about my hair. I'm not going to care about my facial hair. I'm just going to let stuff grow and I'm going to let stuff get crazy you know and that's that's basically what i did i grew this pretty you know not this big but probably you know a decent sized covid beard as i would call it and then i let my hair kind of get all mangly and crazy and uh you know unfortunately my hair is thinning and my, i think i'm losing my hair now in my in my 30s but back when i was like 26 27 i think i was 27 you know i still had pretty crazy thick uh curly hair and I was in the process of shaving off my COVID beard, which, you know, this is a little bit exaggerated, this length here, but it was probably down to about this point um, in length. And uh, while I was shaving my beard, I left this like long bit down here on my chin and put a little rubber band in it. Um, and uh, I think Megan might have helped me braid it, or maybe I braided it and then put the rubber band in and I thought it looked super funny um, and took this photo of myself and shared it with some of my friends. And I probably even put it on Instagram, you know, because I don't care about looking professional uh, on social media that much, or at least at this time, I didn't really care. But anyway, I thought it was a funny image and uh, decided to make a painting based off of it um, where I was really playing with the form and playing with the format of the shapes and the color palette. Obviously, it's not a natural looking you know, color scheme. Um, obviously, some of the stuff I'm doing is very like design focused where I'm really thinking about line, I'm thinking about shape, I'm thinking about proportions and distances of shapes, uh, scale. Um, I invented this background just, you know, honestly, that's easy to do because it's very simple. Um, I was doing a lot of drawings at this time too, if I remember correctly, uh, in my sketchbook with colored pencil um, in like the, you know, late spring, early summer. Oh yeah, so what I, so actually I found the page here in my sketchbook. I started with a drawing, you know, so you can see everything in the painting is really based off of this sketch, this drawing. Um, except for the background that I just came up with kind of on the fly uh, in the painting process. But, you know, everything in the painting really was based off of the very expressive, um, uh, exaggerated look, almost borderline caricature um, uh, depiction from that photograph. I really like how the painting turned out. I love the way that the, the reds in the hair um, have a lot of variety, even though it's all a very solid shape with a, a fairly uniform hue. That red kind of bounces between, you know, very dark to, to somewhat lighter versions of the color. Um, there's moments where that phthalo green are mixing with the red, so it becomes more achromatic, more muted. Um, so it's fun to, to have paintings where I can go back and remember what it felt like to, to really feel like you're in control of the color that you're putting down and how you're you're adjusting those color properties. So that was a lot of fun to do in this painting. Um, that one was about eight inches by eight inches. Um, technically, this should be in the drawing portfolio, but uh, this was a another one of those Canio 
reference uh, paintings, drawings, actually. This is with charcoal and colored pencil. This is of that artist, Alexander Wilby, who, if you don't know his work, you should look him up on Instagram. His handle, I think, is just called Wilby, W-I-L-B-Y, something like that. Uh, if you type that in, you should be able to find his profile pretty quickly. Really just awesome, I was going to say dynamite, which is, it just sounds funny, but he was a, he's a dynamite painter, um, really good at design, really good at composition, kind of the same thing, but to me, composition is like the whole painting, right, or the whole drawing, the whole, the whole image. When I think of the word design, that word, I think, can apply to the whole image and parts of the image. That's my impression and, um, you know, version of that word. So when I look at his paintings, um, even though they're sometimes very solitary in the subjects, like it's usually just a portrait or an animal, mostly portraits, saying animal doesn't really, I feel like makes sense for his work. But um, when you look at his paintings, a lot of times it's like a single form, maybe it's hands or a face. Um, and there's moments in that depiction where he's designing things. Maybe I should just look him up really quick. That might be easier to, uh, let's see, um, to, to talk about as opposed to just being like, this is what his work looks like. Alex will be, uh, yeah, here we go. Let me, let me just pull this over here real quick. So this is just a Google search of Alex will be. Uh, I just typed in will be artist. Let me click Alex will be. Um, but when I talk about his shapes and the way he's designing portions of his paintings and his work, this is what I mean, right? So like we have this single portrait, beautiful atmospheric, uh, very controlled palette, very controlled tonal uh, painting of this figure, uh, really just the portrait. But when you look at the way he's simplifying passages of the face, they're so good at um, I can't zoom in on this because it's on Google, um, but if you look him up, you'll see the details of what I'm showing you. Um, the way that he's breaking things into solid shapes is so satisfying and so uh, like proficient, um, so mature, so um, just all around dynamic for what it does to the painting. I think I need to let my dog out real quick. Hang on one second here. Wanna go outside, Lenny? Oh, all right, go on. Um, it's pretty cold today here in Wisconsin, so I gotta remember to let him back in in a couple of minutes here. Um, but anyway, when you look at his full portfolio, you'll see more of those examples of how he breaks things into shapes. Um, now I'm getting like super sidetracked talking about someone else's paintings. Uh, when I'm supposed to be talking about my paintings, but since I didn't prepare like the little um, you know image slideshow that has you know been down below my uh, my screen of myself, um, this is me sort of making up for that a little bit. So anyway, forgive me for that today. Um, anyway, that's Alex Wilby. Check him out if you have the time. This is a portrait that he uh, shared the reference for in the Kano chat. Um, this is another artist that's in the Kanyo group, um, and honestly, I haven't I haven't looked into that Telegram app. I haven't looked into Kanyo. I think they have their own Instagram account for it too, where they'll share people's paintings that are tagged with Kanyo. Um, and I don't know what the word means either. That's part of their whole brand and identity uh, is that it has this very ambiguous name that like nobody really remembers where the name came from. But these are all charcoal drawings. Some of them are charcoal mixed with colored pencil. Um, and they're from those photographs. I actually all of a sudden have to use the restroom. So I think I'm gonna take a quick break. I'm not gonna stop the stream. Uh, so if anybody's currently watching, you know, uh, feel free to take a break too. I'm gonna keep the stream going. I have this other um, little like, you know, pause scene that I can put up. I'm gonna turn off the audio while I run to the restroom real quick, but I'll be back in just a minute or two.
Okay, and we're back. So, uh, obviously, <laughs> I was prepared for that moment. I, um, you know, I've known, I was like, one of these times I'm going to have to go to the bathroom, so I should prepare to find a way to, to keep the stream going without having to stop and, and start a new stream. Um, what I need to figure out now is how to play elevator music when I step out of the room like that. But if anyone streams or knows if that's something you can do um, in terms of like copyright stuff, let me know. I'm always uh, interested to learn how this stuff works. But okay, where were we here? So I was talking about the Kano drawings, which like I said, this technically shouldn't be in this portfolio. I need to, I need to take these out and move them into the drawing portfolio. Um, but I'll probably wait until after I stream the drawing portfolio because you know why talk about these things twice? Um, okay, <clears throat> if we keep going here, here's another one. This was one of my favorite ones that I did during this time. And all of these drawings I'm showing you are probably about five by seven inches, maybe like a four by five, no, probably five by seven if I had to, if I had to guess. This one is with charcoal and uh, sanguine or sanguine, however you pronounce that. It's like a kind of a compressed pastel, uh, very hard pastel drawing tool. Um, most of them come in this like burnt sienna kind of pigment. Um, so that's what I use to, to show these like warm, uh, you know, little passages and warm highlights. I'm hoping, there we go. I was gonna say, I hope that this has a, a higher resolution file, which uh, a lot of my small work, I like to scan in because you get really, really great quality in the reproductions. Um, and it's easier, I think, to to um, match like the values and the colors and that kind of stuff too when you scan. Um, otherwise, for larger pieces, I, I use my DSLR camera, but I'm not a photographer. You know, I'm not trained in you know, photographing artwork, it's its own art form. And, you know, if I ever get to a point where I can afford to hire someone to photograph my paintings, I think I might start doing that because, uh, you know, if I'm reproducing things or even applying to shows or sharing stuff on my website, it's best to have the most accurate uh, file you can. Anyway, uh, this is another painter artist um, whose name at the moment is, is escaping me. Um, which is a bummer because I also really like his paintings a lot too. Wiley maybe? That might be totally wrong. Um, but if you look up Kanyo, uh, you'll see paintings, I don't know, I can't, even, I can't even promise this because I think if you search Kanyo, you're gonna get like hundreds and hundreds of, of painters and uh, thousands and thousands of paintings that are under that like um, hashtag or whatever. Uh, but let me let Lenny in real quick here. Come on, Lenny. Good boy. Um, but, yeah, if I can think of him, I think it might be Wiley, actually. Uh, or Riley? Eh, I don't know. But he's a, he's a very talented artist, too. Um, at some point, maybe I'll uh, remember his name or share that in the comments somewhere or something. Or maybe I won't, I don't know. I might just forget to do that. Um, we'll see. So this was a painting I made, obviously a self-portrait. You can see I was growing my hair out at this point. Um, I actually, I, yeah, I, I started growing out my hair, you know, during the pandemic and kept my long hair through, I think like the end of 2021. I think going into the start of 2022, uh, Megan, you know, gave me a, a pretty short haircut, uh, which was good, you know. Uh, but anyway, this was uh, when the, you know, pandemic was probably about, we were probably about four or five months into the pandemic at this point. And, you know, I, I really started to understand what life was going to look like at the time. I should have reheated my coffee when I went to the bathroom. Um, and I made this painting specifically to enter a competition, this online competition uh, by this group called the, it's the something academy. It's like the new academy or something like that maybe. Um, but I, I came across this uh, like 
listing for a juried online virtual show, which at this time there were like endless amounts of opportunities to show your work remotely online, which I had very little interest in that because you know you're you're still having to pay a submission fee. Um, granted, you don't have to pay to ship anything, but um, you know if something sells, like you're still giving up a commission to that group, and you know I mean to some extent. It's deserving because um, they're sharing your work with their communities that maybe they have. But I think I was a little bit jaded about that format at this time because there were a lot of people starting art, you know, platforms and artist platforms and uh, spaces for exhibitions that were pretty much only online exhibitions. And it just sort of felt like it was like the new thing to do during the pandemic was like start an art group and start an arts organization and charge people to show their work with you. And like you just opened this, you know, account or you just started this platform like a month ago. Um, I just had a hard time agreeing with that, uh, that sense of value that people were expecting you to, to bring to their opportunities. That being said, there was a different group that's been around for a pretty long time and they hosted this like online series of exhibitions. Actually, I shouldn't say exhibitions, they were just contests. And uh, one of them was a portrait painting contest. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make a self-portrait. You know, it's the pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna try to make a painting that really encapsulates this feeling of, of COVID and uh, all of the, you know, subtleties and obvious feelings that I had at this time. So I set up a mirror in our little spare bedroom that I was using as a studio for um, most of 2021, or I should actually, I should say most of 2020 into 2021. And um, I, I chose to, excuse me, I chose to wear this t-shirt that Megan bought for me over the summer I still have it. It says 2020 sucks. And uh, because I was painting from a mirror, that text is reversed. And I debated, like, maybe I should switch it so you can actually read what it says. But um, I was like, you know what? If I if I paint it accurately to what I see, you know, that's more of a true self-portrait, right? Otherwise, it, can, it starts to feel like, oh, I'm painting someone else. And I wanted to really paint, you know, myself in, in that moment. So... Uh, the mirror had part of the, the uh, you know, imagery on the back wall of the room. And for the most part, it's a pretty graphic painting. Like there's a lot of sharp passages and sharp edges. Uh, there's a lot of rough brushwork happening in the painting. My favorite area is the portrait, though, because it has this kind of buttery, um, immediate quality about the marks. Um, and... It's honestly a way, a way that I was painting that uh, also informed how I was gonna paint plain air at this time too, because I was starting to paint outside again. I wasn't a student. I felt like you know I could paint whatever I want. It doesn't have to be part of a larger body of work. Um, and I tend to be the happiest and most fulfilled when I allow myself to, to do projects that don't already fit into a neat, kind of like system uh, or thread or theme. So I do these like one-off projects at times, but you know, that's what I, that's the kind of artist I am. That's the kind of person that I am. So um, anyway, long story short, I entered this into that competition. The painting by the way is about, it's pretty close to like 16 by 20. It's a little bit smaller than a 16 by 20 on a wood panel um, that I cut down and primed up and everything. But the painting was entered and I ended up winning second place, I think, for uh, like overall. They had these different categories, like one of them was like best, uh, you know, best color or best composition. And I think then they had like overall awards. And I'm pretty sure that it was second place overall. And what was cool about it was that part of the award was uh, this set of drawing materials. So they sent me this like really nice really nicely packaged set of drawing materials, I think by General. So it had a bunch of charcoal and, and like graphite tools. Some of those little kind of compressed uh, uh, like pastel sanguine kind of drawing tools too. And then they also sent a figurative artist handbook, which is a book that anybody can buy. I think it's available on Amazon even. Um, and the book is, 
It's really designed to be kind of a guidebook for people interested in painting the figure. So um, I still have it. It's a really nice book, and I've, I've read parts of it, but I think I'll use it. Um, I'll probably end up using it when I'm teaching other students and use it as a resource to share ideas and methods and some of those things. So anyway, it was a really fun uh, painting to make and a really cool outcome for this contest. And it was one of the first times I'd entered like a open class art contest uh, after grad school. And honestly, I think, you know, it gave me more confidence to feel like, you know, if I wanted to do the plain air painting events, like it's okay, you know, and it's hard. Sometimes I, I've been in rooms in academia where it feels like, you know, like the opinion is that you shouldn't commodify your work and you shouldn't make what we do competitive. And I agree with some of the logic there. Like I think that competition can be um, somewhat detrimental or toxic to an artist's process and practice and their creative spirit. However, I also see the other side where sometimes it's it's a it's a source for motivation that people um, some people need, you know, and some people really want that kind of motivation to to make bounds and leaps in their progress as an artist. And when you're in that environment and atmosphere of a competition where you you're like, hey, if I really focus here and if I really apply myself, you know, I can potentially gain opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise, you know? And I think being an artist is this constant navigation and balance of finding your way and finding opportunities that, you know, really fit you as a person and fit your work. Um, and the challenge with that though, is that everyone's gonna have their own journey. Everyone's gonna have their own, their own, uh, process of finding their way and navigating the opportunities that really fit them and that last painting was sort of the door that's like it was like the opening of that door for me as an artist because um, for me I've my dream has always been I want to be a full-time professional artist you know I went to grad school I loved going to grad school I'm really happy I went to grad school a lot of people go to grad school so that way they're eligible to apply for higher ed teaching positions for universities and schools and colleges. And, you know, I, I love teaching. That's something that I would like to do, you know, if the right opportunity presents itself. And, um, you know, if I'm at a place where I, I want to have that kind of a career, but um, I went into graduate school wanting to focus on my work. You know, it, it wasn't to go and get a, a, a certificate that would hopefully lead to job security, you know, that really wasn't my intention of grad, of going to grad school. So um, because that was sort of the focus of the program that I was in was like kind of preparing people to be academics and to be professors and to, you know, be able to work within an academic sort of setting and institution, which again, don't get me wrong, that helped me a lot uh, to go through that experience and I learned a lot. Um, and I was exposed to a lot of things that uh, otherwise I would have missed. So anyway, um, coming out of that experience, you know, I, my head was like, I want to figure out how to do this and survive as an artist, you know. And um, I came across those competitions and, you know, it helped me feel like maybe it's possible. You know, maybe this is the way. Maybe part of it is putting yourself in these sometimes competitive um, opportunities because sometimes that's what people want. Sometimes that's where you meet your collectors or you meet your, your gallerists and your curators and your, your artist friends that you're going to want to collaborate with and learn from. So you just have to be open to those opportunities. That was what I learned, uh, like going into 2021 and uh, eventually going into 2022. Anyway, back to the paintings. This is obviously another self-portrait. You know, I've painted a lot of self-portraits. It's, you know, it's it's this this muse and subject and form and model that is always there and available, right? And that's why I've painted so many self-portraits. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons is because it's convenient. You know, it's it's uh, it's familiar, but also unfamiliar because you're changing as a person as you get older. And every time I do a self-portrait, I feel like there's this new quality about my inner self that I want to somehow put into the work or put into the the painting. And um, this particular painting was one that was made 
Um, I'm just reading Jane's uh, comment in the chat. She says, or asks, do you repurpose panels if the painting doesn't pass muster? Yeah, for sure, I've done that. Uh, I've done that a handful of times. Um, you know, it varies. I go through phases where sometimes I'm like, I should just let the work sit. There's something here, I don't know what it is, but if I do anything drastic, I might lose this this moment that is actually has potential. You know, and with time, it's gotten easier for me to notice when a painting has that sense of potential still. Um, Cause that's, that's really the hard part is knowing like, well, is it really, should I just get rid of it? Should I let it go? Should I find something else? Should I start something else? Should I start over? Um, but some of my favorite paintings are ones that have this other, this totally separate, different life underneath what you see on the surface. And I think there's there's a, a magic to that kind of willingness to layer and willingness to uh, evolve and change or adapt in the work. Um, and sometimes that means a certain area gets covered or scraped off. Sometimes it's, it's the entire thing gets painted over. Um, but yeah, for sure, I've I've been in those moments. Um, you know, from a, like, let me think. Like even in undergrad, there were paintings like that where I I was too cheap to keep buying new panels or to, you know, to afford more paint, and it kind of felt like a waste to make a painting and throw the whole painting away because you're like, that was paint that I paid for, and I don't want to just like dispose of that. So uh, a lot of times I would I would just keep painting over stuff, um, you know, and and I talked in, in one of the first streams about uh, a drawing class I took as an undergrad student with the printmaking professor, Bob Erickson. Um, and he had us do a project where we worked on the same surface for like two months or a month and a half. So it was like, I don't know, 12 or 15 class periods where we kept drawing and painting on the same paper. And what happened was you built up this really, at least for mine and a lot of my peers, but I, I, the painting that I ended up making has this like weird organic depth to it that you can only really achieve when you layer and layer and layer and layer on the same panel or the same canvas. And that's what happened in this self-portrait here. So um, this was a self-portrait. It's, it's a pretty modest size. I think it's about maybe like a seven by nine or an eight by 10 panel. Um, it's on a cradled piece of of half inch plywood, which is a, a material I've worked on a lot over the last four or five years. And um, I really like working on wood panels. Um, and plywood, depending on the kind that you get, it can be fairly lightweight, which is sometimes kind of nice um, if you're traveling with your work uh, or shipping your work. So I kind of got in the habit of painting on this plywood that's called sandy plywood. It's S-A-N-D-E. Uh, unlike birch or maple, um, you know, sandy is like another type of plywood, uh, type of wood. Um, and it's really lightweight compared to some of those other uh, types. Um, and it was a little bit cheaper. Um, so I, I purchased quite a bit of that material when I made my thesis barn structure. So a lot of the walls and uh, you know pieces to that structure were made with sandy plywood. And when we took down my show in the, in the winter of 2021, um, or it was either the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021, we, we went back to the museum and you know masks and everything, we took down our shows. And then I rode to the uh, art building with Walt Peebles, um, who I mentioned in, in one of the past streams, I think the last stream, um, and he helped me cut down my my wood panels of my barn, and uh, he, he cut cut them into pretty common sizes, like eight by ten, eleven by fourteen, twelve by sixteen, you know, and then a few that are a little bit smaller. But anyway, this was on one of those pieces of wood that he gave me, and I'm glad that I'm remembering that because. There's something also sort of significant, I think, about where our materials come from and the life that they have prior to housing the work that we associate to the object. That's a very wordy statement, but what I mean by that, if it doesn't, if that's hard to like, you know, make sense of what I just said, what I mean by that is when I look at these paintings that were made from part of my thesis project that have this other life to them, 
Like it used to be part of this barn structure that was a container for all of this other meaning. And now it's like this lowly piece of wood that is just here to hold paint that's on the surface. Like for me as the maker, there's something to that, that it, it's so much warmer and organic and, and personal and significant than if I just would have gone to the store and bought a panel off the shelf that looks exactly like every other panel on that shelf. And I think during this time, I really became interested in the character of the surfaces of the object, as opposed to just the painting and the image. I started to really care about the object and the qualities of the object. Um, so what I like about these panels is that the edges are very, they're very organic and kind of imperfect. You know, so like there's not this nice clean square edge to the panel. Um, it's got this little bit of a roundedness to it. The corners are sanded, but they're not perfectly round. Um, the paint that was then applied to the surface is very kind of chunky and organic. I like that it feels almost earthy. Um, and you know, like it's it was buried underground, you know, so the, there's moments where when I'm painting, I go, wow, I just sort of stumbled on this quality and this character that I didn't really plan for. And I only got here because of this, this history of decisions that I made, you know, and being able to tap into that sense of discovery is, is easier at times than other times to do, you know, and I think it depends on your headspace when you're making the work. And for me, when I'm painting something like a portrait, uh, especially a self-portrait with this one in particular i i remember i painted the initial layer it was pretty loose pretty gestural this was one of the first paintings i think i started in our new home which was in cedarburg wisconsin my wife and i had just moved to cedarburg at this time from michigan and so we had just finished living in michigan for four years we moved back to Wisconsin and started renting half of a house, the second floor of a house, which was a very small amount of space, um, right in like the downtown area of Cedarburg. And we loved that area, you know, and, and all of my work had to really kind of shrink down, you know, partially because we didn't have a lot of storage, partially because I, we had just moved and I had to like purge a ton of work from grad school and I just was like I'm not interested in just making a bunch of stuff you know and I'm more interested in making paintings that are going to say something that I'm going to need to hear down the road or something I just need to really say right now you know and and this is one of those paintings that I look at now and I'm like I really love this painting um you know which is it, it's you know from a distance that probably sounds very self centered and narcissistic and but to me it's like it it represents so many different philosophies about painting that i have come to love and really kind of um cherish and champion as an artist like letting go of control you know allowing yourself to learn from the process allowing yourself to work intuitively allowing yourself to try to try to find a sense of 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 nature or or um, familiarity in your work while also towing the line of letting go of control, right? And that's a hard balance to try to find, at least for me. But with this painting, the process became how can I continue to layer and bury and build the information on the surface of the painting that, that has all that stuff I just said, right? How can I still conv convey this accurate depiction of myself where I look at this and I see myself, you know? And it's, again, this isn't one of those paintings where I want someone to come up and go, oh wow, that's you. Like I can tell it looks just like you. I want someone to come up and not really know maybe who it is right away. You know, maybe they come up and they see someone else they know or they see themselves or or maybe they, they're they drawn to the surface quality or the, the color qualities or the, the like the visual, um, physical qualities of the paint, right? Because if we zoom in again, there are these moments in the painting where the paint ends up like a quarter of an inch thick. And a lot of those moments were made by scraping my palette 
when I was working on this painting, when I was working on other paintings, and I would just scrape up the leftover paint and then just stick it on the panel, you know? And I was starting to kind of like surround the portrait with this very physical, um, thick language of paint that began to kind of bubble and it began to take on a life of its own. And eventually when areas would start to kind of dry, I would paint over that and I would sort of like that Kanyo red CD figure painting I talked about earlier, I would unify that area by, you know, a common color, which was most of the time this like burnt umber, raw umber, sorry, I'm burping here a little bit for my coffee, uh, this kind of burnt umber pigment. And that also kind of fed into the like organic earthy feeling that I, I came to love in this painting. But while I was doing that, I also was glazing, kind of glazing and scraping and glazing and scraping and glazing and scraping over the portrait, probably like five or six different times. Um, and I ended up with this, this surface that has so much variety and um, it has evidence of the hand. You know, you can find marks that feel very like intentional and like trying to be descriptive and accurate to my observations in the mirror that I was using, that I was painting this from or with. Um, and then there's moments where it feels almost like accidental. Like some of this, like I couldn't have just gone and just made. I had to, I had to get here by adding and removing and adding and removing the material and the paint. So uh, it's a painting I really love. And I'm thankful that actually my mom, you know, uh, she bought this painting when I listed it for sale on my website. And, um, you know, it sounds funny to say that out loud, but how lucky am I? How fortunate am I that, you know, I've been given so much space and time in my life, especially my adult life, to to embark on the journey of painting and art making. And on top of that, to have a family who who supports that and encourages me, but sometimes supports me financially through through buying my artwork and buying my paintings and and um, you know collecting my work like anyone else would, because um, it's you know that's something that I've grown to become more comfortable with over time. It's taken me a while to feel like wow my my mom wants to buy a painting or my sister wants to buy a painting or my brother wants to buy this painting or my aunt wants to buy like you know it's just like you kind of start to feel a little bit like oh, I feel kind of. I feel kind of guilty, you know, charging them money, you know, when it's this person I love and this person who supports me in so many other ways already. Um, like it, it just feels strange. And through a lot of conversations and like podcast episodes, I've heard of other artists talking about that. And, you know, I remember as I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm remembering this moment when I was an undergrad at Stevens Point. Um, I'm just going to start to flip through some of these because I don't want to take too long today. Um, but I'll talk about this series in a minute. Really quickly here, I just wanted to say that there was a moment in undergrad where my painting professor, Diane Bywaters, was was on leave for a week for, for something, and uh, she had a sub. And I remember this sub, um, whose name is escaping me now. I'm doing very poorly with names today, I feel like. Uh, but I do think that artist, his name was Riley, by the way. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, the sub teacher, she sat down with me like during her one of her rounds around the classroom and just was chatting with me while I was painting. And, you know, she was talking to me about art shows and art fairs. And I somehow we got on the topic of like, I want to be a, a professional artist. I want to do this as my profession, you know, and I want to survive as an artist. And, you know, she gave me some some advice and some tips and shared some of her experiences with selling her paintings and you know, showing her work. And uh, I think her name, I almost don't want to guess because I'll feel really bad if she watches this and then I, I totally, you know, said the wrong name. So I'm not even going to try. But we're friends on Facebook and she's continued to support me on Facebook. Like she likes my stuff and will comment on stuff sometimes and has responded to my email newsletters before. So this is why I feel really bad that I can't remember her name right now. Um, and... Uh, I almost want to say like Shannon or something, but I don't think it's Shannon. Gosh, it's hard when you're trying to just pull one name out of out of your memory. But anyway, she said this. This is the point of the story. She said to me, 
you know, you're going to you're going to find that a lot of the people that purchase your work and collect your work are going to be your friends that you grew up with, they're going to be your family members, they're going to be your neighbors, they're going to be people you you have a connection with that that you already have a relationship with. And she said she just said that and I don't remember if she added anything else with that remark, but that stuck with me you know, all this time, because she said that back in like 2013, maybe 2014. Uh, So like 10 years ago, and I've thought about that a lot over the years that like, you know, as weird as it sometimes feels to see someone spend what I would consider a lot of money on a painting, um, you know, because I'm an artist, I'm poor. (laughs) I don't have an endless, you know, I, I mean, my wealth comes from feeling like I'm fortunate to be able to paint and to be able to spend a lot of my time developing my work and to, you know, pursue painting as a job. And sometimes it's that's a blessing and sometimes that's an amazing experience. And sometimes it's really scary and it's really hard and it's really unpredictable and it feels like you're doing everything you think you're supposed to do and you're not, it's not working. You're not making sales. You're not getting commissions. You're not getting opportunities you're you know you're seeing everybody else get that stuff and you're just sitting there like what am i doing wrong you know why am i bad at this and that's a whole another conversation that i could spend an hour or three hours talking about so i won't get into that but you know i don't have a lot of money so i don't buy a lot of original art from from people i know i mean I'm, i'm starting to kind of get into that i have a budget and a range that i can afford um and i try to to really you know take those opportunities when I can get them. Um, that sounds kind of weird, but anyway, uh, to, so to, to watch someone else purchase a painting, it sometimes it, it feels a little bit awkward. It feels like you're like, are you sure you want to buy that? And like, it's a lot of money and it, it's taking, it's taken me and it still is, is taking me some time to, to make sense of that part of the process and to make sense that that is to some people that's their thing they want to collect work they want to get to know you as an artist they want to they want your art to be part of their life you know and and they're willing to pay the money that that is associated to the value of what you make you know and coming out of graduate school and and kind of starting to apply myself to more opportunities where i could sell my paintings that internal dialogue came up more and more and more and more often. And every time I make a sale, it gets a little bit easier to be like, you know, that's this is what they want, you know, and how I feel about it doesn't really matter. You know, my part of the job is that I make the work, you know, and I make this thing that that can resonate with this person and hopefully can continue to generate meaningful encounters for them in their life, you know, whether it's with them, whether it's when their friends come to their house, whether their family comes over, and then they can interact with this object that I've created and shared with them. That's, that's my part of the process, you know, and um, every artist has their own definition and their own relationship to that idea. And that's how it's supposed to be. We're not all supposed to feel the same way about selling our work and letting go of our work you know because that's a whole nother side of that conversation which how how like well timed are we you know that this painting with multi-sided dice are being shown as i'm talking about the sides of that process right and um how funny is that so that's a great segue to get back to the work again um so what we're looking at right now are a series of or is a series of gouache paintings on paper um, as I mentioned, gouache is a opaque watercolor medium that I started to use when I was in grad school. Um, I think it kind of came out of looking at a lot of illustrators and muralists and studio artists that used it for kind of like a preliminary medium, you know, where they could try out ideas, they could work really quickly, they could work in languages that dry really fast, right? So when you when you paint with gouache, the water and the medium kind of soaks into the paper, the water evaporates, and you're left with this sort of chalky, matte uh, surface, but that can also be uh, watered down and diluted so that it's almost like watercolor, right? So what I love about a lot of these paintings is that there's a range in, 
in density of the mark is how I would define it, right? There's areas where it's more opaque, areas where there's more of a transparent feel and look. Um, and all of these paintings are structured with the uh, framework of being about the human body. So you may have already noticed this as I was flipping through. All of these paintings have two nipples and a belly button. And they're kind of bizarre, you know, that's the least, that's the easiest way to put it. They're meant to be very uh, kind of weird and quirky and strange, but familiar, uh, very, you know, kind of human and humane. That's another, that's another aspect I, I was, I'm hoping that the work conveys is that even though they're very strange and they're very sort of surreal, I want them to feel very personal and kind of intimate and Part of that comes out of the scale. So these paintings are all four inches by six inches. They're very small, they're on paper, so they have this like pulpy, organic surface quality to them. And because they're made with gouache, currently they have a very chalky matte surface, which honestly, I'm not in love with that part of, of gouache. Um, I'll talk probably in depth about sealing gouache paintings in a future video, probably when I get to the plain air portfolio, but currently all of these paintings are sitting in a little um, kind of like plastic photo, archival plastic photo binder. Um, that way they're not getting ruined and they're remaining nice and flat. Uh, but I've debated possibly mounting them on wood and framing them like I would any other painting in like a little float frame. Um, honestly, I've also kind of been thinking of you know how cool would it be if I framed all of them as one solid painting like just make this giant or what would feel giant it probably would end up being like five by five feet or somewhere in that range maybe a little bit smaller um, but in like a massive grid style frame like how cool would that look with all of these paintings you know and because it is a series and it's a body of work that uh, is meant to be about one idea with a lot of variations, right? So that's this variation on the theme of, of objects being embedded or housed in and on the human body. And everything here is pretty much invented except for the little objects that are that are on and in the body. So these are all little objects that are real objects from my surroundings. So. This is a little um, glide floss container. Um, here's a card from the playing game Magic the Gathering, which I do play. And, uh, you know, it's probably one of the more, you know, nerdy things I like to do. Um, I hate saying that because it sounds like a, like a negative thing, but Magic is a really fun game. It's a very complicated game, but once you learn how to play, it's like chess on steroids because there's so many ways that the game can be played and there's like thousands and thousands of cards that each have their own abilities and rules. And um, I like that that uh, open-endedness that the game has. So I've been playing it for, let me think, since I was on that bicycle trip with Megan in 2016. So what is that like, I don't know, eight years or so now? Um, and uh, yeah, so I wanted to kind of pay homage to the game and my love for that game. Um, and really the idea here is like, it's kind of like some of the images I showed in my thesis portfolio where I had paintings of myself with like a lime kind of being held up by a pocket of skin, you know, almost like a kangaroo flap. I like this this idea of, of holding something close to you, you know, and and carrying things with you, but in a way that's not, actually possible like i like this idea of like what if our skin could be f turned into like a pocket what would you put in the pocket you know and um just the weirdness of that idea alone makes sense that that i would make paintings that are weird like this but these are dice from you know playing the game magic the gathering and i've never played dungeons and dragons i kind of want to try the game it it looks really fun and i think if you have the right group of people it can be a lot of fun but that also is very time intensive uh, to learn how to play. So I haven't I haven't had the time to to crack that game open yet. But here's our little Amazon Fire Stick uh, remote control 
you know, so a lot of these things, it's like sometimes they're very personal things and things that hold a lot of meaning. Other times they're just kind of like, they happen to be in my environment. And I just, I was like, I wanna paint that thing. And what was really fun about this project is that all of the objects you know, I'll say almost all, just in case I didn't do it once or twice, but almost all of the objects that are depicted as being held by the skin were painted from observation. So they're not painted from a photograph. They're all painted from looking at the object in real time, in real space, and documenting my observation of that object. So I, I also like that extra little layer of connection that these paintings have because of that. You know, and again, because these are pretty small paintings, I could scan them in, and I ended up with some really nice, high quality, uh, you know, reproductions of these little tiny paintings. So we can see the way that I was painting here is very, um, almost like a pointillist, impressionist approach, where what I what I came to to enjoy in terms of the painting process was that, you know, I would mix up a color on my palette, and I use a little metal folding watercolor palette as my gouache palette. And I tend to just let the paint dry in between sessions. Um, haven't really found too many issues with doing that, but um, I'll mix up a certain color and then I'll sit with my little very tiny brush and I'll hold the paper, or maybe I'd have the paper on a little piece of wood or something and I would sit there and I would paint in this small four by six inch piece of paper with this tiny brush and I would build up the layers with like this little pointillist approach, you know? And um, I kind of fell in love with that look and that feel of of, uh, of mark making and edge quality. So I like that there are moments where the opacity of a passage in the painting almost like dissolves and fizzles out into more of a transparent, washy, uh, sort of texture on the surface. And some of the paintings even have this little like kind of line under the belly button, under the belly, where maybe like underwear or like a, a, a pair of pants are starting. So I kind of liked this like this repetitive composition, you know, and like playing with this composition of like, well, what if I put the object over here? Like honestly, it kind of became an exercise in composition uh, to some extent because I could choose where I would put the object that I was gonna paint. Sometimes it was on the lower right, sometimes it was up by the chest, sometimes it was right in the middle, sometimes it was really smaller, or maybe there were two things like the dice. Um, so it kind of was a, a way to also practice possibilities in composition, you know, when I knew I was always gonna have three particular elements, you know, one, two, and three with the belly button. Everything else then was sort of like open for play, you know, and there's something about that framework when you're painting and you're learning things about painting that is really, I think, kind of critical and crucial to to force us to work within parameters and to work within restrictions. You end up making choices that are really creative and you, you kind of end up in this pattern of like, well, I, I've already tried that once. I don't want to do that again. I want to see if it, what happens if I do this instead. And when you sit within the same like, like structure of a process for long enough, you end up with all of these different results that you can then learn from. And you can refer back to of like, hmm, that was a pretty cool solution I found to this, you know, the, these parameters that I worked within. You know, because again, a couple of the parameters are, these paintings were four inches by six inches, so they're really small. They're on paper, so they're pretty fragile. They're, you know, made with gouache only with gouache and um, they're made with fairly small brushes, right? So it's like I was already working within certain rules. Um, so I got to a point after maybe four or five of these paintings where I realized, hmm, some of the some of the process I'm dealing with here is is figuring out how to compose within the structure of the nipples and the you know the belly button. you know, what do I want to do with that? And some of these objects, like the last one was of a sticker. That was a real sticker that I, I produced from a painting that I'll talk about later on in today's stream. Um, this is a Campbell soup can, which if you know art history, is a pretty loaded image uh, to some extent within art history. You think of Andy Warhol and this idea of reproduction, mass production. So I kind of liked finding things that maybe already had a little bit of a context to them and a meaning to them that, uh, you know, it's like, what happens if I throw that in this series I'm, I'm playing with right now? So that was sort of the moment here with the Campbell Soup Can. And, um, you know, you can see where I'm starting to also 
play around with a little bit of the variety in the body. Like I decided to put this fold and crease uh, in the stomach area, which, you know, I'm very familiar with this line in my own body when I sit kind of hunched over, like I, you know, something I see often. Um, I've got a little uh, ramen noodle packet here. And some of them, I tried to push some of the chromatic relationships and contrasts a little bit. So you'll notice in some of the shadows, there's there's a fairly, you know, chromatic blue that I'm using or a violet or maybe even reflections of warm colors coming from the, the excuse me, uh, the object that's being painted. So I didn't do it in this painting, but like, Maybe I, I could have put some like orangey red little notes here to, to tie it back to the reflection of the uh, ramen noodle container. Um, earlier I was just talking about framing these as either one solid painting or separating them. That's the other option is like if I did mount these on paper and I wanted to seal them so that they could be viewed in frames without glass because typically gouache is a medium you really want to frame behind glass because it's very 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 susceptible to uh, being affected by water and moisture and especially if water hits the surface it will reactivate the paint and then when it dries you're left with these little like paint circle you know shapes and marks and it totally will disrupt and and change your image um, so it's a very fragile surface and um, I've found that if you spray these with uh, a UV matte archival varnish, it's a very long title, but there's, I think Krylon maybe makes it. And this is a technique I found from watercolorists in the plein air circuit we're doing this because uh, they didn't want to have to frame with glass because it's expensive to ship, it's very fragile, uh, adds a lot of weight. Um, and it also disrupts the ability to connect with the surface of the painting, which for me, that's the biggest reason. I don't want to look at these through glass because it feels, I don't know, it feels farther away. And there's something about the surface that I really that I really enjoy about these paintings. Um, because in some of them, these little marks, these little dots, they have a physical, a very subtle, but physical um, relief. Like they actually, they raise the surface just slightly in some of these small little dots. And I love that about these paintings because um, the surface has variety too. And that's something that I'm always trying to be, I don't know, thinking about. Here's where you can see some of those blue colors in the shadows where I'm really pushing the temperature of the shadows. And I really loved that play of color uh, in some of these. But anyway, I was gonna ask you, if you have an opinion on the framing idea, let me know in the comments of the video and uh, let me know what you think I should do. What would be more interesting to see? I'm not going to do a vote. At some point, I'm just going to make a call. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do something. And I might not decide what to do until I've mounted these on wood and sealed them with uh, the varnish, which I never finished. So after the varnish, once the varnish is dry, you can use a very thin layer of wax medium to then seal the paintings. And what the varnish does is it will help aid in protecting the integrity of the image uh, against the the effects of UV exposure, right? So when you look at a tube of paint, on the back of the paint container, it will have like two or three different categories of identifying numbers. Now, some of the numbers are going to tell you what pigment is in the paint or what combination of pigments are in that particular tube of paint. Some of them are going to tell you if the paint is opaque or transparent. And then it's going to give you a rating on its light fastness. And the light fastness, light fastness uh, rating is going to tell you how that pigment holds up against UV exposure. And some pigments are very weak against UV exposure. Like one of the most famous pigments is alizarin crimson. The traditional alizarin crimson is a very weak light fastness pigment. So they found synthetic pigments nowadays or they've created synthetic pigments that are close to alizarin crimson that have a higher rating against light fastness so anyway the varnish is going to protect against that the wax medium will protect against the moisture um, issue so what's nice about the wax is that it resists moisture and it will protect the painting underneath the wax uh, in case it's very humid it should help with that 
the important thing is if you try this with your work, because um, in my experience, I've had very little problems uh, so far in paintings that I've mounted and sealed in this way. Um, a lot of times I do this for plein air events because I like working with gouache. It's very fast drying. It's a lot like drawing, you know, so I'm not dealing with wet paint. Um, and then I can seal and frame those paintings on paper that are already mounted to a wood panel. The important step, in my opinion, is that when you mount your painting or you mount your paper, because it's it's always better to mount the paper before you make the painting. So if you're gonna want to, if you want to work in this way, definitely mount your paper first before you make your painting, because otherwise you can potentially damage your painting when you're mounting it later on. So that's something I'm gonna have to be very careful about. I should point this way. That's something I'll have to be very careful about with this series of paintings is because it's a fairly fragile surface. So when I glue down these uh, paintings on paper, I'll have to be very careful about getting a nice, even, smooth seal with an archival PVA acid-free glue, which is always the glue you wanna use if you're mounting works on paper, or even like canvas and linen to wood panel. Um, really quickly, this is a, a painting with a, obviously, a, hopefully you can tell, this is a chocolate chip cookie, part of a Visa card. So in some of these, I was kind of pushing the absurd, uh, you know, irrational, kind of crazy combination of objects and forms that didn't have any sort of meaningful relationship prior to being combined into a single painting. And there's something about that that I really like when I'm painting uh, is bringing together two like separate uh, subjects that are unrelated and giving them a like physical place to form a connection. You know, whether that's my own interpretation of the, the relationship or if it's just open for viewers to interpret and to uh, determine. But this one was really fun to paint. I remember painting all these little transparent hairs in the chest. So in some of them, hair is a bit more of a, of a character in the painting, maybe like moles or freckles. Um, I also like how the warmness of of reds and oranges and yellows uh, and pinks can kind of give this impression of body heat or feeling flush. So there's something about that that was really satisfying to kind of play around with in this series too. Um, but anyway, this was I think this was a pretty early one in this body of work. That's the thing is I'm not showing you these paintings in any, to my knowledge, I don't think these are in chronological order. Um, but these, these last couple ones here, I think are pretty early on in the process. Like this was a water bottle that I, that I used to have. I like these Nalgene water bottles that are the tall ones because you know a lot of times I'm painting outdoors and I don't have access to water and I don't wanna run out of water. Um, and this is, my, <clears throat> this is my second, I call these, I, I heard someone else call these silos, these tall uh, like 48 ounce water bottles. Um, that's my second one. This one in the in the painting was my first one. And I'm really sad because I I get attached to things like water bottles because I travel with them and sometimes they they get their own like cool sticker, you know, arrangements and uh, juxtapositions and the sticker then relates to something else and like this sticker here is the logo for Art Path, which is the is the uh, the mural project on the Lansing River Trail that I talked about with the Robin mural earlier in today's discussion. When I did that, not the Robin mural, but when I did the second mural with them in 2021, uh, part of the like goodie bag was this sticker and uh, a t-shirt. I think they gave me a couple stickers actually, which was pretty cool. But anyway, I'm, I'm really sad because I don't have this water bottle anymore. I forgot it on a trip last year in May when I went to the plein air convention. I was invited to go to the convention to receive an award. And on my way home, when I dropped off my rental car, somehow this water bottle must have slipped out of my backpack and was left in the rental car. And it was something that was so meaningful to me that I, now just for context, this painting was made in 2021. So two years later is the story that I'm telling you uh, in Denver for the convention. And I remember I got on the bus, on the shuttle to go to the airport, which from the rental 
excuse me, from the rental place was like 30 minutes away. It was pretty far away from the airport. And uh, I went to the airport early, like almost 12 hours before my flight. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to stay in the airport overnight before my flight in the morning and uh, I'll just stay up all night, you know, and that was kind of what ended up happening. But anyway, on the way to the airport, I uh, was on the shuttle. We got like five minutes away from the car rental place and I was like, I'm really thirsty. I should take a sip of water. And I reached around the my backpack, which was ginormous at the time because, you know, I didn't have big a big suitcase that I brought with me. Um and nothing was there. And I was like, what the heck? So I started looking around my seat and under the seat and couldn't find my water bottle. And, uh, you know, it's just a water bottle. It's not the end of the world. But because it was a water bottle that I already had for a few years, you know, this is a stupid, silly story, I realize. But um, I got off the bus at the airport. And as, I, as the, the, the guy was sort of like helping a couple other, there was like one or two other people on the bus at this time. It was like right before the place closed, um, the rental place. Or I thought that, I thought that was when the, the shuttle and everything was going to be over. I asked him, I was like, hey, I, I, I lost a water bottle. Can you, is there any way that you can like radio to the people back at the company and see if they found a water bottle? Because I had all this time, you know, I was like, I'm not really, you know, crunched for time. Uh, to get to catch a flight like I was gonna sleep in the airport so I'm like I might as well like ride back on the shuttle see if my water bottle is there and so that's what I did he radioed in and they started looking and he's like you can come back with me um, and his he kind of had broken English a little bit so it was a little it was kind of a challenge to uh, to to uh, talk with the driver at the time but I was hopeful I was like all right I can go and I can find my water bottle which as we know, I did not find because I have a different water bottle now, but I remember I got back to the rental place and he he's like, okay, go talk to that person over there. Uh, they'll know if they found your water bottle. So I, I walked over there and I asked this guy that was in their little like security arm booth, you know, for their parking lot. And I said, hi. And he's like, are you the water bottle guy? And I was like, I was like, yeah, have you heard anything? Have you seen anything? And he's like, He's like, really? Like you're? Uh, he's like, for a water bottle? And immediately just started like judging me that like I would care this much about a water bottle. Water bottle, and I was like, I mean, yeah, I kind of want this water bottle back, you know? And he was like, no, we didn't see anything. And then just basically like shooed me away. So I gave up. And uh, then I rode back to the airport a second time, and eventually slept in the airport and came home. But it was a bummer, you know. And it was a, even more of a bummer because, you know. I hope this is interesting if you're watching this uh, because this is nothing to do with painting. Um, it just sort of sets the stage for the significance of this this little painting that I have still. But anyway, on my way to Denver, I took a flight from Milwaukee to Denver and the craziest thing happened. On my flight, I ended up sitting next to the mother of my high school high school girlfriend that I dated for like two years and got to know their family really well in high school. We broke up shortly after we graduated high school and it was just insane. Like I was on this somewhat small plane and everybody was on the plane for the most part. There were a couple sort of stragglers coming down the aisle and in that line, I saw this woman. I'm like, I know her. And I was like, that's so-and-so's mom. And what was funny was that like, I thought no one was gonna sit next to me on the plane just because Almost every seat was full. We were going to be taking off any minute. And uh, she ends up sitting right next to me. Her seat was right next to mine. And we just, um, it, I was like, are you so-and-so? And she said, oh my gosh. And she said my name as I was, as, as I was, <laughs> can't even tell a story. As I was like, I'm Hector, you know? She was like, oh my gosh, Hector, like, how have you been? Like, we haven't seen each other in like, I don't know, 12 years or something. A long, long time. And that was the start of my trip to the plein air convention. That's how I flew to Denver. Like I spent three and a half hours just reminiscing and reconnecting with this person that in high school, her mom was very, was a really good role model in high school. She just was very intelligent, really, really kind, really funny, really warm, really progressive politically, you know, which 
I think in high school that was important for me to be around people that had pretty, you know, global worldviews. And uh, so it was just really nice to see her. The point of telling that story is that during all the commotion of, of seeing her, of chatting with her, usually when I fly, I wear headphones and I just sort of do my own thing like most people. Um, and I had these Beats, like, you know, the lowest, cheapest level of Beats headphones that you could buy. And this was like a year and a half, like a year ago. Um, and so I, when I, when she sat down and we started talking, I was like, well, I should take my headphones off. So I took off my headphones and I, I folded them up and I put them under my seat or like, you know, by my feet. And obviously, you know, where this is going. When we got off the plane, I forgot that I put my headphones there and I was kind of in a rush to get all my things because we were still sort of talking that I got off the plane and didn't realize that I lost my headphones until like 20 minutes after I'd gotten off the plane, you know, and I, I had walked back to the, uh, the stand. Actually, I don't know if I did. I think I might have realized it later. I submitted a form. Or you know what? I realized it when I was waiting for an Uber to, or a shuttle to the car rental place. So by that point, I was like, well, I really need to get on this shuttle. I really need to go get the car. I don't have time to go back and ask about the headphones. I'll just submit a form. And that didn't get anywhere. You know, they never found my headphones. Somebody got free headphones out of that. But anyway, long, 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 long story just to describe that part of my experience. Um, so sometimes we make a painting and then down the road, the painting is gonna represent something totally different than what it meant when we made it. And this is one of those paintings for me where now this is like a little you know, commemorative painting for a water bottle that uh, I lost on this really fun and really amazing trip. But unfortunately, you know, it kind of represents another, you know, other aspects of my career and my life and a chapter in my life. And I'm one of those people where like, I look at inanimate things sometimes and they, you know, it sounds weird to say I'm one of those people. I think all of us kind of do that where we put meaning and associations into things and stuff around us. And, uh, you know, you get attached to those things. So this is a, this is a great example of that process. Um, but anyway, that's the story about the water bottle. Here's a, a phone with kind of a screensaver I had at the time with me and Megan. This was the picture that I took uh, minutes after Megan agreed to be my wife. And uh, when I proposed, this is the photo that I took right after I proposed. So, you know, very sentimental, very personal um, kind of moment that is about a very, you know, a very important time in our lives and in my life. And, uh, you know, it's funny to kind of play with that seriousness and then throw in these like kind of uh, humorous and bizarre image imagery too in moments too where we have this like tattered underwear, jockey underwear that's painted in here. And honestly, that's a little bit of a, a realism uh, you know, moment too. Some of my underwear I've had for, for a while. I don't want to get too uh, revealing and personal here, but I think that was inspired by a pair of underwear that I still had for like years and years that she and I joke about. So it's it's a funny painting because it's sort of, initially it's like, oh, it's a very, you know, heartwarming and, and lovely painting about love and about life. And then there's this like the realism of life kind of at the bottom there. But again, these are all four by six inches. They're very small. So you'd have to get pretty close to see some of the details that you can see uh, here in the live stream. Um, but kind of saving you a trip here by zooming in and showing you some of the stuff. And so I made these paintings, let me think, in 2021 after I started doing plein air events. And um, I did my first plein air event in June of 2021. Uh, in Cedarburg, where we moved, and um, had a wonderful kind of introduction to the plein air event model and experience, and that inspired me to continue searching for similar opportunities, and it's led to this really wonderful experience that I've been uh, fortunate to, um, you know, to be on the last couple of years now. But this painting, this little painting, was made maybe like four or five months after I had started doing those events, you know? So uh, fortunately, there was one of the events I, my painting had received uh, first place. So I had one of these ribbons. So this, again, this is painted from observation. Like I, I have that ribbon still down in my studio. 
All right, I think we're out of the gouache chest kind of series, but we're not out of the chest uh, framework and structure yet. So because I was doing all these little gouache paintings of that format, I started playing around with the same concept and the same visual in oil paintings. So this was kind of like a nocturne painting, um, you know, where I switched the palette up pretty, pretty drastically. And I like this blue palette of the body and, you know, it almost gives the painting a little bit of like a, an alien feel or a low light feel. And I kind of like that it hits on either of those planes for me. Uh, here's another one that you know, is getting back into layering and scraping and playing a little bit more with uh, non-objective languages where it's just about color and shape and texture and edge and, uh, you know, more of an abstract language paired with uh, very descriptive um, illusions of forms and objects. So, you know, it's combining some of the things I was exploring around that time some of them are getting into thinking about architecture and the body holding holding meaning for more of an architectural space. I kind of liked the the potential for concepts like, you know, we are a house. The body is a house. The body houses things. The body houses memories. The body houses feelings. The body houses ideas. And, you know, there's so much to that very general I concept or idea that uh, I could then play with, you know, combining these objects and these forms or even thinking about space now all of a sudden. Like what if there was a window in someone's chest? Is the window showing us the outside world or the inside world? Where is the viewer, you know? And I like the idea that the on one from one perspective we see the body, like we are outside of the body, right? Because we're seeing the surface of it. But then we see this window that is showing us an exterior space. So I kind of like that too. So it's sort of this like, you know, doubling of, uh, of exterior space. But then at the same time, this window is casting a shadow here at the lower portion of the painting. So now all of a sudden we have light coming from the outside to the inside space, but we've already determined that the this space in the painting is actually the outside. So again, it's kind of like a weird like dubbing of space and and like overlap of uh, conflicting space, which was fun to do. Uh, this is the first painting that I'll talk about today that incorporates a character that I um, came up with that I termed or called uh, neighbor or the neighbor. And I don't know what led to uh, wanting to to find some sort of a symbol or some sort of a surrogate for the figure in uh, paintings for me but part of the I think part of it came out of feeling a little bit um, a little bit burnt out on painting self-portraits through my thesis show and then you know in a lot of the paintings I just showed after grad school and I, I hit a moment in 2020 where I see now I can't remember if this is maybe no maybe this was in 2021 when I started painting these this like neighbor pie wheel kind of shape character. Honestly, it could have been 2020. It could have been 2021. What I do know is that the drawing for the character started in my sketchbooks. And I have another sketchbook uh, that I had through most of grad school, especially my thesis here, which is not the red one. It's same the same size, but you know, you can see where I was drawing this character in my sketchbooks, and uh, it really developed in that other sketchbook. Um, and this is the sticker that I was talking about too, which is also the same character, the neighbor character. Um, but you know, I, I've through grad school and undergrad, I've studied artists, especially contemporary artists who use some sort of invented. Uh, character there's a really famous artist named cause k-a-w-s who started off as a street artist he kind of started playing around with uh the mickey mouse character and kind of invented his own take on that and which became its own thing it kind of became a cause character and uh i've seen other artists do similar things and i kind of i was enticed by that idea of like 
you know, maybe if I can get away from the depiction of the human body and the human form, I might be able to, you know, convey stories or ideas or philosophies um, in a way that didn't feel like it was like personal, right? It didn't feel like it had to be about my idea or my version of those ideas. It could be more universal, right? Because I'm not starting with an identifiable figure. So I came up with this like pie wheel, oblong cylinder head on the body of, of figure, kind of a human body, but the head was different. And I tried to come up with something even saying I tried to come up with something isn't really the right way to say it because I sort of fell into it and it just kind of happened for a while. For about a year, I was making paintings with this character and I never showed the paintings like as a group anywhere. Um, I think I've sold a, maybe a couple of those paintings. I have most of them still. And I've sort of been left with this little body of work that I don't know what to do with um, because it is pretty different from other things that I've done. But at the same time, we can see ideas and techniques and uh, even compositional devices that I was using in other paintings being played out here as well. So there are some overlaps and, uh, and similarities. Now, really quickly to give you a sense of the scale of these couple of paintings I'm showing you right now, this one and this one, uh, so yeah, these two, and then there's a few others that are all, I think they're like two inches by three inches. They're very, very small, or maybe two by four, uh, maybe even smaller than that. Um, they're very tiny little gouache paintings on paper that I made with very small brushes. And um, I don't know, I think I was interested in scale at this time. I was interested in seeing how much information I could pack into such a small area of of paper and space um, while still holding some kind of definition and clarity and description. Um, so it was a lot of fun to do, you know, and you can see how I'm starting to play around with this, the format of the character, this neighbor character, where sometimes it's its own floating object and its own sort of shell of a form, like in this one. Um, and again, these are very small. I still have these paintings. I never framed them. I kind of want to get these framed, I see them finished in like fairly, you know, modest but large scale, uh, scale frames, like maybe like a, a 11 by 14 or something, but the painting is super small, kind of framed in the middle of, the, of a large mat, like a piece of mat board. That's how I envision these being framed. I like this, that contrast of space, like really big open space around this little tiny painting. Um, and I've been making my own frames for so long now that I think I just, I have to swallow my pride and, and get it framed somewhere else to, to fit the look that I kind of envision for these little paintings. So this is, this is one of the last ones I made that was that same scale and size. And, uh, this one actually inspired a larger painting that is in the portfolio that I'll get to here, uh, hopefully pretty soon, because this is a very long stream. We are at two and a half hours. Um, but I'm having a lot of fun going down uh, this portfolio or going through this portfolio. So um, what I liked about this one was that it, you know, it's giving us some kind of clues and context for the body and the clothing. I like this like collared shirt and the pattern shirt that is sort of like sweater that this uh, figure or character is wearing. But I also really liked the mirroring of gesture in the like neck part of the head with this tornado kind of shape in the background. Um, that was something that kind of just happened organically at the time. And it was fun to invent this landscape pastoral, pastoral scene. You know, if I could go back and change anything about this painting, I probably would take out this cloud shape. It's kind of, I don't know, it feels a little too cartoony, a little too bubbly and I don't know, fake looking, which, cause the rest of the landscape I feel like is somewhat more naturalistic looking, but then when we get to the cloud, it just feels kinda, kinda cheap, you know, if that makes sense. What I do like about the cloud area is that there's like this little snowfall material that's falling onto uh, the character. Um, but anyway, that's what I would change. 
And then these are some other ones that are starting to play around with the format of the, the neighbor character's shape and, and uh, you know, textures and, and all those things. I, earlier, I called it kind of like a pie wheel format. And, you know, if I'm being completely honest, <clears throat> part of the inspiration for this shape and form came from a, uh, um, a period over the summer in 2020. So this this did start in 2020 because we moved in 2021 and I painted a lot of these paintings in the summer in Michigan. So that would have put it in 2020. Um, took me a while to remember that. But anyway, this was a painting um, after I'd been painting this, uh, this character for a while, probably a few months now at this point. And I was getting to a point where I'm like, I want to see what else I can do with this shape where it's not the head of the figure. Maybe it's a different part of the figure. You know, and I, I still wanted to paint the figure, um, and sometimes I wanted to paint the portrait. So I needed to figure out a way where the presence of the shape, the pie wheel sort of shape, could still be part of the figure and part of the subject without being the head. And this was one of my attempts at doing that. Um, and earlier I was just starting to say uh, a minute ago that part of the inspiration for this shape came out of a marathon that I did of re-watching the show Stranger Things, which is one of my all-time favorite shows in recent years because first of all I watched it as it came out you know and a lot of shows like Game of Thrones or The Office like big cultural shows I missed the window when they first aired and I kind of had to watch them like retroactively after you know everybody would talk about them and everybody really you know like talked up those shows so there's something about Stranger Things where like I felt like I was I was on the ride. I was on the roller coaster as it's been as it's been happening. So it's such a great show that I've rewatched it like three or four times uh, over the years. And you know, it's one of those shows where now I can just put it on and I can be painting or I can be working on things and uh, still enjoy it, enjoy the show because I've already visually seen everything and I can just treat it more like a podcast. But um, the in season one, there's the Demogorgon character in the show that has this really weird almost like like uh venus fly trap like um bulbous sort of head that if you've seen the show you know what i'm talking about but if not the the, the face sort of opens up like this and it's like lined almost like a with like flower petal sort of shapes that open up and on the like inside part there's just like rows and rows and rows of teeth now, I didn't want to make a character that was like violent looking or scary looking, but I liked this idea that something could open or expand or contract, you know, without having eyes or a mouth or ears or a nose. Like I wanted something that was m further removed from like the human form. So in that other sketchbook, I just was like drawing something one day and I think I started like making these like triangle, you know, shapes and then I sort of drew a circle and if I, I could be making this up, but I think that's how it started. That became the like basis for this shape. And then I sort of started to envision this as like a three-dimensional object in my sketchbook and imagine like, well, how would this actually turn in space? And would these lines continue down the side of the, the head? And that's what I ended up kind of coming up with. So it, all, it has a pie wheel feel to me. It also has kind of a citrus sort of feel. But what I like about it is that it has this, this um, uh, construction where the whole is made up by parts, right? It's kind of like the idea of composition, right? Where you're, you bring these things together to create a singular form. And in this front face of the character, I started to view each triangle as like a different section, maybe a different chapter of someone's life or you know, different emotions or different people com coming to become one person. So I liked that it started to offer these like larger metaphors um, in a very non-objective and uh, abstract way, just thinking about shapes and form and line. So, you know, it's some of them I started playing with like multiplying the form, uh, but still having it connect down to a singular source. Like I like that like rhizome kind of idea where you have all these different tendrils and parts that come back, but they're all connected into one solid thing. 
Um, and this was a painting that obviously it's very phallic, you know, looking at it initially, it has this very erect bodily kind of form, which as I've talked about in other paintings I've made, you know, isn't the worst thing in the world when you know some of my personal story and um, you know, my relationship to like masculinity and manhood and like, you know, just uh, some of those aspects about identifying as a man um, but growing out, growing up without a father, right? There's this awkwardness there. And I kind of like when my paintings start to incorporate that possibility for like that, that awkward humor to kind of come into play. And this is one of those paintings for sure that had that. Now, looking at the painting today, after it's been, after I painted it in 2020, maybe even into 2021, this might've been like the spring of 2021, um, I like the way it's painted more than what is painted. Like I'm not totally sold on like the tentacle hair marks coming out of the tops of all of these like cactus like neighbor, you know, character pieces. I like that they all become a single head. Like I like that multiplicity idea. Um, and I like that there are eyeballs floating around and between and behind some of these. Like I like what that does in the painting. It gives this like voyeuristic, you know, distant um, idea of perception a little bit. Like it's almost like this figure is looking at you while you're looking at the figure. Or maybe it's this group of people looking at you while you're looking at them. And then there's also this confrontation with the hand and the way that the hand is almost like pointing out at you, right? Kind of like this. And so there's aspects about the content that I like do I really love the color palette of like, you know, the, the kind of like tan beige color palette? Not really. Mostly because that kind of feeds into the phallic feel of the painting. Um, so I probably would have changed the color palette a little bit. I do like, however, the shadows, you know, because all of this is invented. None of this is from any kind of reference, you know, it's sort of just organically came out of... Uh, shapes and drawing and honestly this actually is based on a digital drawing that i made on my ipad uh, using that autodesk sketchbook program so i made a line drawing and then created a painting based off the drawing you know so in the drawing it kind of felt more open-ended it didn't feel quite as like bodily and phallic because i didn't it wasn't in color you know it didn't have like the the implied textures that paint can kind of give you when you're painting where something maybe feels a little bit more doughy and kind of like soft you know there's there's some weirdness about the quality of some of the forms and I'm like I'm like okay that I painted it but I probably would have changed some of that stuff a little bit more maybe and I don't know maybe that's part of painting you know is like you're kind of meant to just decide on something and then later on you can look back and you can change how you feel about it or you can like it even more you know that's uh it's kind of it doesn't make sense to to always make a painting where you're like i'm always going to love this painting no matter what you know as i change and i adapt and my life changes i'm always going to love this painting it's like how do you know how can you why would you ever want to work that way you know we can only ever just make the decision at that time and then play it out and see what happens this was another painting i made in 2021 I think in the winter, early spring, um, I'm very happy to share that this painting is in a private collection. It sold uh, during a group show that I was in in 2022 with the gallery Levy Contemporary in Princeton, Wisconsin. It's a very like central Wisconsin uh, uh, city, very small town, but there's this very, very, very nice professional um, gallery called Levy Contemporary right downtown in, uh, Princeton, Wisconsin. And I was invited to be one of like six artists, maybe five artists uh, in a group show organized by Art Dose Magazine, which is a, a uh, magazine sort of art. Uh, it's hard to really figure out how to how to categorize what Art Dose is. It's, it, it started as a magazine publication, but now Frank Juarez, who's the artist and educator and curator and publisher and writer behind the magazine, um, he's he's created exhibitions under the name of Artos Magazine. So it was one of those 
um, invitational group shows that I was in in 2022. I brought a ton of paintings. I probably showed like 30 paintings and a lot of them were pretty small, like eight by 10. This one I think is like a seven by nine uh, size painting, maybe six by eight. And it's on a wood panel. Um, as you can tell, it's got a lot of very soft, uh, almost like Renaissance, glazy, kind of Da Vinci style uh, painting happening. That's very atmospheric. There's almost like a chiaroscuro effect happening in some areas where I'm pulling out uh, the paint out of like a dark wash or a dark glaze. It was a lot of fun to make this painting because, you know, I, I worked very slowly and I kind of spent a lot of time finding the form and building up the surface. Um, even though it's a very smooth surface, I also really love the color palette. It's very like electric and uh, reminds me of like 80s kind of horror movies a little bit. Um, or like the Goonies, that character in the Goonies. Um, chuck or, or chunk um, but anyway <clears throat> this painting sold during that exhibition to a curator who works at uh, i think bergstrom Mahler glass or john michael kohler art center i think she's at one of those institutions but anyway um here's another painting with the, the neighbor kind of character morphing into a portrait so you know again I've, i i hit these points where i've done something enough where i'm like okay what else can i do you know how else can I use this, but in a new way? Or how can I combine it with other things I've done? You know, so when you look at all of this paint here, that's the same process as the portrait, the self-portrait that I showed earlier, but this was painted and finished before the self-portrait. So it's sort of the other way around in terms of influence and inspiration. Because I think I finished this painting when we were still, in, uh, still living in Michigan. Uh, I really liked this one too, just because it has a lot of diverse languages of image and mark and you know hidden characters and allowing the paint to be its own thing and its own kind of subject right where all of a sudden it becomes really textural and um kind of gritty um you know so it sort of feels like another character in the painting which you know is something i don't often uh push very much in in my work so it's fun to have examples like this to learn from i have to let lenny out again really quickly here Come on. give him a few more minutes outside um all right it is currently 3 15 ish i've been streaming now for two hours and 48 minutes so i think i need to start to wrap things up which is good because i think i only have a couple of paintings left um so let's end this on a, a high note here. Um, thanks again if you've tuned in at all. Excuse me, if you've, tuned, if you've tuned in at all during the live stream, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Um, if you're watching this after the recording, thanks for sticking around uh, two hours and 48 minutes into the, into the presentation today. Um, I hope that maybe you're learning some new things about uh, some of my paintings, maybe about other people's paintings maybe something about your paintings. Um, doing these live streams is is really about creating a conversation, you know? And I think so much of my relationship to the internet and to online communities of people that thankfully I've met a lot of people that um, have interacted with some of my content online. Uh, other people I haven't met in person, but you know, so much of my relationship with these platforms and tools seems to be very fast paced and uh, difficult to uh, connect on conversations and discussions that have, I've spent a lot of time thinking about when I'm making this work, you know, because a lot of these paintings I talk, I've talk i talked about today were made in pretty long sessions or multiple sessions. And how do you, how do you share a reproduction of a painting that took you know 12 hours or 30 hours in a single picture on Instagram and in a, a caption with only so many words or videos that have you know a cutoff point it just to me it's I don't feel like the work is given the right kind of opportunity to make a, an it's hard to even say this to make an impact with the audience or with the viewer so I'm really hoping that these live streams are creating another way to uh, share 
the context and the process um, that is behind the work. And through this conversation, you know, maybe maybe people will will uh, be able to see something in a new way or um, be able to understand what I'm going to make in the future in a new way. And even if you don't understand it, you know, it's just it's another way of of contextualizing my very personal uh, process and practice as an artist, you know, because the point of painting, in my opinion, isn't to paint like someone else, you know, it's to learn how you paint and to learn what interests you, you know, and even though I talk sometimes about having influences from other artists, like, you know, I hope, I hope it comes across that I'm still the goal really still is to figure out how to find the channel that feels like me, you know, and obviously I've been very good at exploring and experimenting and being very open to different ways of, of thinking and different ways of sourcing information and references and, and using my imagination. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been a really fruitful experience for me as the maker of all of this work because I can I can do this and I can go back in time and go wow that was a really that was a really important period for me or um, the way I the way I was working and I kind of want to do that again I kind of want to see what I could do with that now you know and so far just in the the four streams that I've been doing I've already had that feeling multiple times where it's like man I really want to try that and see what I could do with that again um, anyway. Um, this is a painting, it's about 9 by 12 inches, I think, and uh, it's on a wood panel again, which you can kind of tell uh, based on some of these like surface um, divots in the uh, grain of the wood. Sometimes that's visible even through all the gesso and the paint. You can kind of tell that they're wood panels. Um, but this is another one that just was like layers and layers and layers and layers of paint. Um, over a, a composition and a concept that I developed digitally again with my iPad. So that's where this one started. And the chest little like uh, stomach area here I think was painted maybe from a photograph. Actually, I don't know if that was painted from life, but I really like how this area turned out. It's It has a very painterly, uh, look and feel that I kind of wish all of my all of my paintings had that feel but I'm glad it happens every once in a while and then this is the one that's the neighbor character that uh, uh, was from that tornado that little tiny gouache painting that was the tornado shape that I said became kind of a bigger painting this is also a 9 by 12 I have to go to the bathroom again so I think instead of pausing I'm just going to kind of wrap up here really quickly um, a lot of layers a lot of smooth passages of paint I kind of like that it almost has a little bit of a sci-fi feel to it. It's a very high resolution image here, so um, it takes a while to load some of the details, I think. But um, this one was a lot of fun because it combined a lot of my interests in fragmenting uh, different things and different ideas. Like this ear was one of the first things that was, well actually, let me remember. So I painted the purple head, I kind of painted everything just like the gouache sketch first. And then I did the glaze over the purple with like uh, more of a uh, skin tone and this like very bright red. I started to carve out some of the lines that separate the like puzzle kind of pie pieces. Um, and then I think somewhere in that, those two steps, I had added this little window that had an ear painted in it. So it was like this little rectangle um, with uh, kind of a skin tone color, like a like very like my olivey kind of tan skin color, and then there was this little ear that I painted, and then that got painted over and kind of scraped out in areas, and so it was a lot of that adding, adding or additive and subtractive working method uh, or methods over and over and over again, um, and you end up with these really beautiful organic disruptions in the painting that you can only get if you're scraping the paint or you know maybe even sanding the paint which that I don't recommend because you're turning the paint pigment into much finer particles that would be a lot easier to become airborne um, or to make airborne and then breathe in and that's not a good thing especially if you work with any toxic pigments so 
If you're ever sanding a painting, be very aware of some of those health risks that you're putting yourself in. Um, one way to kind of work around that I found is to use a little bit of water and do more of a wet sanding. It, it, the water will kind of absorb a lot of the dust and wear a really good quality respirator. Um, you know, outside of that, I would just avoid sanding paintings if, it, if it's something that you're nervous about. Um, but a lot of times too, I'm not even using sandpaper, I'm just using a palette knife and just sort of like gently scraping the surface and rubbing out some of those big um, moments of paint and like sort of removing those peaks of oil paint. Um, Cause then the paint is a little bit thicker and heavier and uh, it's not as dusty. So I think it usually sits on the surface a little bit more. It's harder to like breathe that stuff in. But anyway, this was a really fun painting to make. This is one of the few paintings that I've ordered Gicle museum quality archival prints of. And I still have a couple left, I think, that are at the gallery in uh, Levy Contemporary in Princeton that I was talking about. So if you'd like to order a print of this painting, um, it's about, I think it's the print itself is like 12 by 16. It's a pretty good size print. Um, and uh, maybe 11 by 14. And um, like I said, it's on museum quality paper with archival ink, really close, super detailed reproduction of this painting. And the original painting I think is still available at a gallery space in, uh, um, in North Carolina. I don't remember what city in North Carolina that it's in at the moment, but um, it'll come to me later. Anyway, that was a really fun painting to make. And we're almost at the end. I think this is the second to last image in the in the portfolio. Again, this is the neighbor character. You know, this was a really, really fun and satisfying painting for me to make because I started to push that idea of, of multiple figures and multiple people um, representing parts of the wedge wheel, right? This like citrus wheel or this like pie wheel shape. And I liked that we're seeing almost like as if this tubular form is being sliced and then we open up that slice and we, we see what's inside at that moment. I really like that feeling and that idea. And that's kind of how, that, that's sort of the direction I took with this painting. And you can kind of get that sense from some of the like, what is it like uh, corporal, like bodily kind of details here. Um, with like this almost like blood type of, you know, uh, oozing liquid and just like the very organic visceral paint that's uh, applied in these thick moments here on the bottom of the wheel or the face, I should say. Um, and then we have areas of hair in the painting, tattoo ideas. There's an artist, a contemporary artist who really inspired me to think about uh, tattoos as a tool for meaning and, and as, a, as a, a space to provide symbolism and metaphors and meaning. Um, so here's like a little fresh Lion King tattoo that I added in um, of Simba. The reason I wanted to add that into this painting is because this painting to me is a self-portrait. You know, go figure, that's a lot of my work in my studios, like self-portraiture in some form or fashion. But my last name is Acuna, technically the Spanish pronunciation is Acuna with a tilde over the N. But as I've mentioned in the streams, I didn't grow up with my father's family. I didn't grow up with my father. I, didn't, I don't speak Spanish. Um, you know, so I've always felt kind of distant from that part of my family's background. And um, growing up, at some point, you know, people would say Acuna and uh, eventually it became Acuna Matata was like this really quick, easy joke that I would hear a lot as a kid or reference that I, I kind of loved, to be honest with you, because I loved the Lion King as a kid and it's, it means no worries. You know, it's a good, it's a good message and it's a very positive idea and concept. So I didn't mind that the pronunciation would, would kind of would kind of bounce, you know, sometimes it would be a cunha, sometimes it would be a cuna. I think when I was growing up, I would still write the tilde over the N sometimes. Um, but the older I got, the more I realized that like, I don't really feel like I'm a member of that Spanish speaking culture. And there's an awkwardness for me in that realm of my identity. And, you know, there's just things about 
um, that side of my family that uh, I'm not really proud of. Not with my father's siblings, but with him particularly. And, you know, his name is also Hector. And I've always had this weird kind of connection and relationship to my name um, that's been very con conflicted over the years. So there's some distance there with the pronunciation. But anyway, the tattoo of Simba from The Lion King and Akuna Matata, like, you know, it's kind of, you know, it, it is sort of this personal motif for me to some extent. I also like what it adds to the painting cult culturally in terms of the time period of that Disney movie and where I was in my life at that time. I was very young. Um, and there's things that like are older now or, or things that, that relate to me more as an adult, I should say, like some of the body hair and tattooing. And, um, you know, I liked all of the different kinds of paint application that this painting has. Also, I think it's also a nine by 12 panel, wood panel. Um, and uh, there's some portraits here, like this is my sister, and then uh, I th this is my grandmother on my father's side. So I kind of like the, you know, the the layering of different people, the layering of different uh, family structures, family relationships, all in one painting. You know, so in a lot of ways, I think it was a very successful painting for me, just in the the way that I was using paint as a medium for for language and for uh, emotive qualities too, you know, and, and playing with personal motifs. Um, so anyway, that was a painting I made in 2021. I think the, yeah, I signed it 2021. Um, I also thought I did a pretty good job painting this, which, you know, a lot of my paintings, I'm like, okay, you know, they're cool. I like them. I like how they turned out. Um, but having had more experience painting, I think I can look back and go, ah, that's kind of a lazy passage or that's really not my best work that I could do today, you know? But then every now and again, I'm like, wow, this is, you know, I'm like, wow, actually, I feel like I really did a pretty good job with, with some of the areas in certain paintings. And this is one of those paintings for me. Uh, just the control of the material and the way I was combining more impasto kind of thick areas with more glazed, thin, atmospheric areas. It was a, a really fun painting to make. All right, the arrow is gone. This means we are at the final painting, three hour mark. Um, been here for a while. I'm glad I did this in the afternoon because I'm gonna start working on some chili tonight for dinner um, and just starting to pack for a plein air trip I have coming up, which I'll talk about as I wrap up here. But this is the last painting today that I'm talking about. I called this painting Snake Noises because that's actually painted into the painting. And kind of like the first painting I showed, it combines a hybrid sculpture frame painting sort of juxtaposition here with uh, some polyester found uh, clothing that I cut up and, and incorporated into the panel. Uh, it's a very smooth glazed kind of painting. Um, the reason why the painting is called Snake Noise is it's kind of a long story. I'm gonna try to make it quick because I do have to use the restroom. Um, which actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna go to the bathroom really quickly, and I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna wrap up with this painting and then do a few quick announcements, and then we're gonna end. So, give me uh, just one quick moment to relieve myself. I will be right back.
Okay, and we're back. So thank you for uh, sticking with me through the breaks today. Um, all of the coffee and water is just moving its way through me. So anyway, um, let's end this on a, a nice positive, you know, motivated note here. Uh, as I was saying, this is a painting that also was made in 2021. Um, probably like, gosh, it's so hard to remember the, the summers of 2020 versus the summer of 2021 and what work was made when, but I remember I worked on this frame the same time I was working on the larger pandemic painting that I started the stream today with. Um, obviously you can kind of tell just by the quality of the wood, the frame. This one also is about five inches deep, so it feels more like a box that hangs on the wall. Um, it's a painting that I sold also in that show at Levy Contemporary uh, to a collector um, that came out to the show. Um, and the reason it's called Snake Noises, which is where I left off, is because I proposed to Megan in the summer of 2020 um, in, uh, in July, and uh, July 24th to be in fact. Uh, or, or to you know to be uh, specific, um, and we at that time I when I proposed it was in Wisconsin uh, up north at her family's cottage where she grew up going every summer. It's one of her favorite places, and I thought you know if I could propose there, um, I think that would be pretty special. And um, during that summer in July, Megan was you know scheduled to go out to the cottage for three weeks or so, maybe a month out of the summer. And she was gonna hang out with some family that were gonna come from Arizona. And uh, during that month, I was in Michigan still, working with the Saugatuck Center for the Arts. So this is 2020, the story, not the painting. Um, and I was doing this summer camp, art camp uh, residency opportunity where um, with the art center we would we would work with uh, students of, I think, one or two different schools and lead art projects with them for the month of July. And I was driving my van, uh, my, my Ford uh, Con Transit Connect van, um, and I, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna propose to Megan, I wanna do it when her family's there in, uh, in July at the cottage. And I, I had my weekends off from that opportunity um, with the SCA. And I was like, all I have to do is get over to Wisconsin over the weekend and then uh, I can propose and then I can finish off the residency. So um, it, was all, it was like right before the last week of the residency art camp that we were doing. And um, I drove my, my van to Michigan uh, where the ring was, because I had the ring obviously at that point. Um, and I was going to go from Saugatuck to Lansing and then back to Saugatuck. And then that Friday or yeah, Friday that week, I was gonna drive from Saugatuck down around the bottom of the lake, Michigan, up to uh, uh, central Wisconsin where this cottage is. And I drove to Lansing, I got there, Spent the night, um, I was gonna drive back, cause this was like a far Friday or Saturday. I was gonna drive back on Saturday and then uh, kind of get ready for the weekend. Um, cause I think I, I did it a week early. So I, I was gonna go to Lansing, come back, spend the week in Saugatuck, then go from Saugatuck to Wisconsin. And on my way back from Lansing to Saugatuck on like a Saturday, my van, all of a sudden, like the the gas pedal basically stopped working. Like I stopped accelerating um, on the interstate that took that takes you right from that city to Saugatuck, and uh, you know it was like the middle of the morning, like maybe 10, 30, 11, where I'm going around this semi truck, and I remember, like I was going like 80 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, like I'm like pushing down the gas, and like I'm slowing down pretty quickly, and I'm like, what the heck? And I'm trying to push the gas, and like I'm slowing down more and more and more and I'm like trying not to panic because I you know I get really nervous about stuff like that in general and then it's happening and the semi truck is you know obviously everybody else is still moving at 80 miles an hour so I found a way to be able to s s kind of like 
merge over past the right lane from the left lane and then onto the shoulder of this interstate and was able to call uh, AAA, you know, after t after just consulting with like Megan and uh, and my mom and just, I'd never had to really get towed before, thankfully. And they kind of were like, I think you should probably, you know, call a tow truck, blah, blah, blah. And then I sat there for like two hours and tried not to panic about being so close to semi trucks that are going 80, 80 to 85 miles an hour and ended up getting towed back to Lansing because that was like 40 or 45 minutes out from Lansing. Got towed back to a garage, got picked up by a friend of ours, Jake, who was awesome and very helpful in picking me up. He took me home to our duplex in Lansing and I sat there trying to figure out how I was gonna get back to Saugatuck because I had to finish teaching for the next week, next two weeks really. And then beyond that, how was I going to get to Wisconsin to propose to Megan, you know? And I was talking to my family about it because they all, everybody pretty much knew in my family that this was my plan, that I was gonna be coming to Wisconsin, I was gonna propose, Megan didn't know. And it was the, gonna be a perfect surprise because she thought I was just gonna be doing all of this art camp stuff. So it, it was gonna be unexpected and I kind of wanted it to be a, a surprise, you know? Cause she knew that I had the ring, she helped me pick it out and everything. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I'm like panicking, like how am I gonna get to Wisconsin? And I'm talking to my, my mom and my brother and my sister and my sister just like volunteer. She's like, well, I can come pick you up. And I was like, really? I'm like, it's a pretty far drive. Even from where they are to Saugatuck, it was still going to be like a four hour drive or something, four and a half hours. She's like, yeah, it's, you know, me and like her son, who's a toddler at that time. And then my brother, Tony, like the three of them, um, agreed to do it. And, uh, that's what they did. The next weekend came around and like Saturday morning, my sister and my brother and my nephew made their way around the lake. They picked me up and then we immediately turned around and started driving back. So they, my brother and my sister and my nephew, they put in like a nine hour day just to pick me up and help me with this plan, you know, because part of the proposal that I had planned out was like, you know, I, I wanted to incorporate painting in some way, just for my own personal selfish reasons. And I made a, a series of little paintings for her uh, that were, were kind of attached to some signs that I created. And I had this whole plan that her mom helped me, her mom and her uncle helped me develop um, because they were gonna be there, you know, when I would come and set up and get, get everything organized and co coordinated to be a surprise. And, uh, so we went back to my sister's house and then my sister let me take her car up to where the cottage was, which was like an hour and a half south of the cottage. So without my sister and my brother and like my family and Megan's family, like it never would have been able to happen, this proposal. And um, I'm really, really thankful that they were there and, and willing and like just happy to help this whole moment happen, you know? And um, anyway, so I proposed and that story of the van and just like, just the, the, the last minute challenge of getting in the way of this plan and this idea that I had uh, with everything that happened with my van, just kind of threw a wrench into everything. And uh, you know, it added to the story. So that's why when I made this painting, it was right around the time shortly after I had proposed to Megan. And I knew I wanted to make, this is actually I think the first painting that I made based off of the sketch in my sketchbook. So when I show the sketchbook in a future stream, you're gonna see the exact same like design of the figure, kind of the same color palette too actually of this character, um, just now painted with oil paint on a panel. And so I made this and I was like, oh, I wanna kind of throw in some other things in this painting and just kind of float some different ideas and objects into the space. And I was looking through images on my phone and I had a picture of the box with her ring in my phone. And I really liked the shape of the box. And I was like, hey, this is a, you know, why not paint this really important thing that just happened? And, um, you know, see where the idea for the painting can kind of grow. So. This is gonna be a painting where I go like, this is this, this is this, this is that. Um, so I'm gonna really narrow your interpretation for you here, but 
Um, that's what it, that's what kind of kicked off the meaning of this painting for me. And so this was the first thing that went in. And then I was like, oh, maybe there's like a, a car idea that I can somehow bring in and play with uh, just that part of the story of the proposal. So then I put this in here and I think I was I was listening to a lot of Alt J at the time, the band Alt J, and they have a song called Something Good. And it's a very eerie kind of song, like a lot of their music, but I like that it's eerie, but it also, the title is such a positive kind of idea, you know, and, and message. So I painted the, the word something good here, you know, which um, it's just kind of, it's a good contrast to like the tire wheel and some of the like kind of weird, eerie qualities to the figure. And then snake noises, right? So this is how I'm going to finish the story. The title of the painting is called Snake Noises, and um, it seems very random at first, right? And it is kind of, if you don't know this part of the story that I'm about to tell you. So snake noises was a term or an idea that I just organically came across one day through a meme that I saw online. And this meme was like this little hand-drawn illustration that somebody made. And it was almost like a little mini comic strip that had like three different scenes. And in the first scene of the meme, it's this little you know line drawing of a woman and a man and the man's time, he's bending down on his one knee. And you can see the woman is sort of like, because he's tying his shoe, you know, and the woman's already kind of like looking at him. And in the next scene, the the guy like looks up at her and she's sort of like like shocked you know like excited and then in the third scene you see him maybe there's four scenes but you, the next thing that happens is he's like laying he's like laying flat on the ground like his whole body is like flat like this on the ground and then there's a last scene where you just see his body kind of going like this sort of emotion like curving and it just says snake noises and that's it. That's the whole meme. That's the whole story. It's this really arbitrary, strange, uh, absurd kind of little like meme comic strip thing. And when I saw that, I haven't been able to find that meme since I first saw it. And uh, I never, I think I had saved it, but then somehow I lost track of the file or something. Because this is what it said. It, it said snake noises with the asterisks like this. So it's sort of like implying the sound, like almost like. Uh, closed captioning on this uh, meme that I thought was really just so weird and funny and just kind of like relatable a little bit because I'm like I had just proposed to Megan and you know just like imagining like what if that happened like what if you know something weird happened where I just did something really goofy instead of proposing or I don't know so it was relatable but also still kind of absurd at the same time and I liked that about it so I just added that into my painting as this very deep reference that like nobody's gonna know unless you've seen that meme and, and you can somehow put together the engagement ring um, otherwise it's like it's just this random arbitrary thing and it kind of is compounded by the format of the painting where it's in this box with this like you know polyester sweater material that's very non-objective other than its texture. It's just like a yellow rectangle um, in this in this larger box container that is the object itself. So anyway, it's kind of a crazy painting, kind of a weird, goofy, strange painting that now is in someone's home. And I have no idea if, if they have, you know, connected some of those dots or not. And I feel a little bit guilty doing that right now in case that person ever watches this video. But you know, I'm gonna take my chances and say that they probably are not gonna see this, so it doesn't really matter. But anyway, uh, after I made the painting, I was uh, I, I wanted to make a sticker because I thought the the figure was very like graphic and re you know highly reproducible to begin with. Now I'm kind of in the sun here today. Um, let's see if it'll focus. It might not focus, but. You know, you, can, you might be able to see like the sticker has the snake noises part. I just, um, I photoshopped the wheel and the uh, engagement ring down into the, you know, the torso of the figure. So it's sort of like a little mini amalgamation of the painting itself as a sticker, which 
If you're interested and you want to support my my business, you want to support my artwork, I do sell those stickers here in my shop in the print section of my shop. So these are those stickers that I was just talking about. And I've, I've made a few other stickers since then. Um, you can buy two of them as a bundle currently for five bucks. So, you know, if you want to add to your sticker collection or start your sticker collection, uh, these are the two stickers that I've, um, the, the first two vinyl stickers that I produced. Uh, the one on the left is from the gouache painting I showed in uh, a previous stream. But anyway, those are available in my shop if you're interested. If you're perusing my shop, you know, check out the rest of my print uh, reproduction kind of category here. I've got my, my books, my planar zines, I've got some other stickers available, and then a few neighbor uh, hand-pressed prints. So these are relief prints that I made from uh, linoleum blocks that I hand-carved, and then when I printed them, they were uh, printed using a spoon, a wooden kind of like soup spoon to transfer the ink with uh, you know just hand-pressed pressure. So every one of these prints, there's only I think 10 of each color. I've sold a couple of them. I still have a bunch of them if you're interested. Check those out. Uh, they're on very nice quality paper too. Um, so anything you you might wanna know about those prints is explained right here in the listing. So take a look. You know, Now that you know a little bit more about this uh, neighbor character, um, you know, maybe uh, that's, a way to kind of link into the meaning for you of what these prints could potentially represent, which I love. So uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions about any of the work I talked about today. Obviously this was a very, very large stream. So if, if you tuned in the whole time or if you watched the entire thing all the way through in one sitting uh, after it was posted, I applaud you. You have my like endless respect to sit and listen to me just ramble on for hours about work that I made years ago. And um, I hope through all of that you you learned something new and maybe gain some new perspectives on my art practice. And, and you know, now that I've shared some of the subtleties and nuances uh, behind my ideas, I hope that you can appreciate them in a new way. Um, as always, uh, feel free to reach out if you have uh, feedback too. If you just want to share comments, uh, if you don't have questions but you rather would share some some feedback um, on the work, I'm all ears. That's another reason why I'm doing this. It's a way to start a conversation. Um, I can't think of any other big announcements other than once this is over, I need to put in a, a few last minute um, edits into my uh, newsletter that I'll be sending out here shortly today. So um, I think that's it. Now that it's been three hours and almost 30 minutes, um, I just want to say thank you so much if you're tuning in, if you if you add it into the, the chat or if you decide to leave any comments or engage with the, the video in the future. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Hector Acuna. My website is acunaarts.com. Um, you know, take a look around. You might find something that surprises you or, you know, reminds you of, of an experience that maybe you've, you've also had. Um, and uh, yeah, be on the lookout for my work in person. I keep all of my upcoming events for the year posted to my website on the homepage. So, you know, if you live in any of those areas where I'm teaching a workshop, consider signing up for a workshop and uh, you know studying with me in person for a few days. I have four or five different uh, teaching opportunities lined up this year and I'm really excited to get to travel for those opportunities and meet a lot of new people in those communities. So uh, check that out if you're interested and want to learn from me. Um, now I really think that's it. I don't think there's anything else I have to share. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day um, and stick around for maybe another stream uh, in the next day or two before I fly out to Florida for my first plein air uh, competition slash event slash festival for the year 2024. So I'm looking forward to uh, the Lighthouse Plein Air Festival 
which kicks off here in just a couple of days on March 3rd. So I'm, be, I'm flying down there, getting a rental car, and then painting for the week before I fly home back to hopefully a somewhat warm uh, spring March in Wisconsin. But you never know with Wisconsin. Um, okay, now I'm totally talking about different things. So that's it for today. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, I will see you in the next stream. So. <laughs>